Hello, hello. Welcome to Human Design Coffee Talk. Hello. Today we have Sarah Branton on. Hello. Sarah, <laughs> Sarah is a uh, three five. Or, Jesus. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. One three. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. One three emotional projector. Um, super stoked to have her on today. For those of you that are watching on YouTube, you will be able to see her chart. So for those of you listening on Spotify, head over to YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I'll have it up for like the first few minutes, just so you can get a lay of the land. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, We've been wanting to have Sarah on for multiple reasons. And Sarah and I were talking, um, maybe it was almost two weeks ago now, um, in the DMs on Instagram, and we were talking about sex. And I was like, let's get on Coffee Talk and talk about that. (laughs) Nothing better than diving in with emotionals. Mm -hmm. And um, so many other things. We're really excited to talk about your perspective of your emotionality and having 3740 um, and just all the things. I just realized the other person we had on to talk about sex was also a one three projector. What is up oh. with talking to one three projectors about sex? <laughs> so the, the foundation and then tra- trial and error. <laughs> we've, we've investigated. Let's just say that. Yeah, okay. And then we tried it out. <laughs> yeah, because well, like there has to be an openness there because it's an intimate thing, you know. But I feel like one threes are down to share about that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. love yeah. it. Yes. Yes, I feel that. And I'm gonna gonna, I'm gonna get like all shy all of a sudden. (laughs) And I just I'm just curious about your alpha channel, you know, Mm. when it comes to sex. I see I was looking I was I was looking at wavelength. I'm like, oh mastery through repetition. All right. I mean, there's a lot of angles we could take here, clearly. (laughs) Oh you guys (laughs) I'm getting nervous now. I know. Take me to dinner first. Gosh. I, I know. Yeah, let's I, warm I, up. I know. I just realized yeah. too. I'm sitting with two emotionals. I'm like, let's go. And yeah. You guys this are is... like, you need to wine me and dine me. We need foreplay. <laughs> yes. I mean, like, I'll just I'll just say like straight off the bat, a new revelation that I've been sitting with and processing is being so I'm in direct determination. And mm-hmm. so that has been like a whole contemplation in terms of sex because it's like don't come at me like direct Mm. you know like it's like what's like sexuality like laterally you know what I mean like horizontally so that's like a really fresh contemplation (laughs) wow so can you think of a time where you experienced the opposite of that and what that felt like to you yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, I like, I think I have to preface, like, whenever we talk about sex, we are also, like, entering entering into a space where we might be talking about sexual trauma or, like, sexual mm. challenge. Mm-hmm. And that's just always in the room, right? So I think that, if like, it feels important to, like, name that, like, right off the yeah. bat. Yeah. And so, like... Definitely, like, I've had experiences, especially being across the planning, especially with the 4037, like, I, like, I need, like, touch, I need communion, I need companionship. And so, like, the bargains that I've made in in the past have definitely been, like, okay, well, I will sacrifice particular things so that I can get that need met. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so, like, now... I'm much more discerning about that and much more boundaried about that. Like these are all like, I'm just, I'm just laying on you like all of my like most recent contemplations, like also being Shaw's like boundaries, like where's the boundary line? Like all of these things have been on my mind lately because my body has been reflecting years of not doing that. Oh, fucking let's go I've never I connected have... the shores piece of it and boundaries oh. and how important that is for us uh because do you know what our transferred environment is or kitchens fucking kitchens and what are we oh doing in kitchens it's not it's we're not collaborating a... it's we're co- 
we're coll- but it's boundaryless like it's this yeah. energy. try anything try of of mm. of alchemizing and oh my god I'm ha- my I'm feeling so many like epiphanies in my body that I don't even have words for but you just talk mentioning that <laughs> wow yeah that's really interesting too because my husband's also shores mm. and we've been together for a long time but like known each other for a long time and so I did my experimenting in my 20s but him and I were still friends and you know as a fourth line (laughs) we dip back into that pool often you know we'll go back to our friends or if we already have a foundation Mm -hmm. with somebody Mm -hmm. so him and I were still kind of hooking up and then I'd be going on dates and like testing the waters with other people and I always just remember feeling so uncomfortable with a lot of new experiences that I would have and there was never that same kind of comfort level with him and he's always been somebody that's been very respectful of boundaries never pushed anything um not super experimental in the way that I would have other people that would kind of come out of left field and I'm and like take you off guard we're like wait a minute whoa you didn't ask if I you could do that mm-hmm. or like you know and there's just not that um yeah and I feel like when you're a young or I'll just speak through my lens of being a young woman in my 20s and not always having the courage to say, this is a boundary for me, or I didn't like that. Let's not do that again or whatever. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot to play with around that. And just, yeah, now having that sink in of like, wow, a partner that really can respect the boundary or even identify it or whatever is probably really important for us. Yes. Holy cow. My whole life is making sense right now. Even you just saying about like the kitchens and like that's even a piece that I hadn't had and you just colored it in, in terms of like when I was younger, like in my 20s, I was like, I'll try anything once, which is like also true, like as a third line. I mean, you don't know until you know, right? Mm -hmm. But definitely like being post Saturn return, it's like, no, like I'm not just up to collaborate and like try new things and what the fuck like we didn't why why are you whipping that out all of a sudden you know (laughs) like Mm -hmm. whereas like when I was younger I definitely especially being like undefined sacral like I would have been much more open to tasting from the full spectrum you know and like trying everything on and now like I mean like I'm very much and I think you probably both are so similar in that like the body like communicates with us and tells us things that's going on and like if the body isn't liking something it's like okay like I got to pay attention Mm. yeah yeah being a four six you know that fourth line and then my pre-roof phase which I call being in the rave so I was in the rave and also now I'm having this awareness that very much in the kitchen in the rave and that I incurred a lot of like sexual trauma because Mm -hmm. I think I was trying to, I don't know, fit in and try the things and, you know, experiences with people and, you know, in my network, (laughs) um, I'm just realizing how I am at a stage in my life now being post Saturn return on the roof having a partner who helped me instill those boundaries or reminded me that they existed, Mm. you know? Um, Wow. And also that you can, that you can ask for what you want Yeah, and yeah, it'd be okay. Cause I think there's still a, at least this is for myself, you know, my own. And I know Brandy, you and I have had conversations. Like if we don't like something, we can say we don't like it Mm -hmm. and we're not going to get, in trouble or they're not going to get mad at us or (laughs) you know we're allowed to have boundaries but it's just crazy because I feel like when I was younger I was so afraid to say like I don't like that or Mm -hmm. you know it's so different to be with somebody that just respects that and doesn't take it personally well and forgive me because also my child probably will listen to this podcast I don't know if he will because he likes to listen and he'll probably try to listen for Sarah's voice um (laughs) He loves Australian accents. Uh, yes, my son <laughs> loves Australian accents. But <laughs> um, this spurs why Sarah and I were recently talking about sex in the Instagram DMs because I was sharing with her how I had this epiphany um, 
around, and I had talked to Teresa about this around my libido. Like I thought there was something wrong with me. And I thought that, um, my husband's indirect too. So now I'm also kind of playing with that in my brain with Mm. his indirectness, uh, about how I thought I was like losing my libido or I needed to fix something, you know? And then I was like, I don't really, I spent a lot of time trying to fix something. I think there's actually nothing wrong with me. I think I'm my husband is a uh, non-sacral and that theme of not knowing when enough is enough or just having that projector emotional projector focus on you is like very intense and so our exploration time was <laughs> was was just that <laughs> sex exploration <laughs> and i realized that i was just a no to like the amount of time and focus that that was and i had a conversation with him and i was like i think i kind of need some generator sex not from a different person but when i say generator sex i mean like generators just get in there and get out. <laughs> like, let's just have some quick satisfaction. Let's just have, I'm just looking for some satisfaction. It's much I, more like functional, isn't it? Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like, I, I, it's almost like practical. Totally. Yes, like that's absolutely. how I would describe my husband and I. Like, it's like, we've been down to a science at this yeah. point and we're both <laughs> totally satisfied with that. Yes. Yeah. And so when I would like feel like a no or feel like I don't have this desire or this, you know, yearning. It's because it was like, I actually, what my sacral is saying is I'm not available for two hours, mm. of sec- uh, you know, of sex exploration. Of sex exploration. <laughs> so I'd be like, I literally just need some way and bam. Thank you, ma'am. You know? Yeah. And him and I had that conversation and that was like, you know, you know, circling back to like boundaries, but I can confidently talk with him about those things because, and not that it's a boundary, not that that's not going to happen. And like I've said before, I'm sure every person would hope to have a partner that will worship their body. Like my husband does. Mm -hmm. I'm not complaining. (laughs) I'm just saying like, I've got a lot of stuff to do and I don't always have the amount of time to do that. And let's talk about at the end of the day, being a sacral being, I might be tapped already for, Mm -hmm. from, you know, the day I might be sacral satisfied and out. And so if you catch me at the end of the day and he's indirect, so he comes alive at night Mm -hmm. and it's just a whole bunch of things where I can see through human design, like where we can have those discussions where it's not taken so personally. Yeah, we're in like a relationship where you might not have that information. You might just be thinking, oh, we're so incompatible because we mm-hmm. want different things. And But instead, we can look at it and see, okay, yeah, we're just designed a little differently. Like, how can we work with each other and our differences so that we both get what we want out of this? Mm-hmm. What you were saying, Brandy, about um, thinking that there was something wrong with you, I feel like is such a big theme. And especially mm-hmm. in relation to sex, because it's like, even though our culture is so sexualized, we still have so many barriers to talking about sex. You know, like the amount of energy that I had in my body this morning, even just like before, like before coming onto this podcast, like I was like, whoa, okay, like what are we going to talk about? You know, um, but it's like because it's so like held back, it's like don't talk about it under the covers, in the dark, like, you know, in the shadows and I mean again like I'm indirect so I like thrive in that place so it's like not lost on me that we're like talking about this and bringing it like out in the open here um but yeah that piece about like feeling like there's something wrong with you like I totally relate to that but like from a totally other perspective you know what I mean like being like more inconsistent like sometimes it's all the time and then long periods of like nothing at all and then being like, oh my God, like, am I, am I broken? Like, is really like mm-hmm. the question that we kind of ask ourselves. And then I've also like have this piece like right in my periphery about like also being like anyone socialized as a woman or being in a female body, just being like, there's this whole other piece that's like right there about needing to be sexual in a particular way, like for uh-huh. a purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. 
I was just talking to my husband about, well, not quite that same thing, but it's just like how I'm almost 35 and I feel like my whole life I've been unconsciously like dressing for the male gaze and I feel like I'm having this like awakening to who I really am now and what my style is and what I like and I'm actually kind of a tomboy and so I was telling him how I'm like realizing that I actually like to dress almost like tomboy but with a feminine flair and there's this like reawakening to myself that I'm having and that's like how I dress as a kid and somewhere along the way I kind of got lost in being like I need to look sexy I need to look the way that men want me to look so that I appeal to them and I feel like something similar ends up happening you know that extends to the bedroom it's like so many things and facets about our personalities and who we are end up then extending to these different areas of life and so yeah to me it just like feels very connected like the way that I express myself the way that I dress the way that I show up and also like my sexuality and like who I am in that way and I just wonder if some women pretend to like certain things or be a yes to certain things because it's it appeals to men absolutely yeah 100 yeah. percent. I mean I mean that's that's conditioning, right? But we're, it's like one specific facet of it. Mm, I don't think I have further thought on that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The in conditioning around, what are the words I want to say? It can bring up shame. And I'm thinking in particular, because my husband's indirect. And this is so funny. I just have to side note this. If you listen to our episode last week, that was super fucking cryptic and vague. And then this week we're talking about everything. I I did listen to last week's episode and I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? That's what a lot of people have been saying. Like, what the hell? You guys are holding out on us. And I said, you'll all get the tea. You'll get the tea when it's, when it's, when it's, when it's ready it's to be served. Yeah. <laughs> so this might come as a shock as we're being so open today about things, but my husband's <laughs> indirect and indirect. There's the darkness, the shadow, the, you know, um, going towards things that are kind of like taboo, you know, um, didn't he have like a book on Satanism? <laughs> dude, when we <laughs> like got together, curiosity. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like hope motivation, all like dun, 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 dun. and like we move in together and I have like Louise Hay books and all this rainbow books and shit, you know, and he and I'm like going through our bookshelf when we're moving. And there was the like a book of Satanism, not because he practiced, but because he he's interested in learning. Like he's also like, I also read the Bible, you know, um, because he's just like looking at the systems of religion. And I was like, that's so dark and uh, and he used to wear black eyeliner and wear spikes around his neck and have his whole face pierced and, you know, heavy metal music and <laughs> a very dark person, you know? <laughs> so in, you know, in the bedroom, I think I know that he had this like yearning for like more taboo type things. And some people could shame people for that. But then I'm like, that is very indirect, like. It is, you know, like diving into taboo things and stuff like that. So I think there was this part, this time in our relationship where that stuff started to, like, he felt safe to, like, express those things. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm cool with that. You know, we can talk about kink, whatever. Um, and he was, I could feel this, like, you know, like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't have to, like, be so vanilla. You also have a 3536 electromagnetic. We also have a 3536 electromagnetic. <laughs> oh my gosh. There were one year we were in Santa Fe together and they were telling us what podcast they listened to driving over. <laughs> and so they're recommending podcasts to Thomas and I as we're driving home, you know, and they're like, oh my gosh, you should listen to this podcast. It's like this couple that tries out kinky things. <laughs> <laughs> and like oh they do God. it like obviously it's audio only but and Thomas and I put it on and we were like looking at each other like for probably like a good 20 minutes we tried to listen to it because we're like let's give it a try they say it's really good and we're like, okay this is not for us but we try right I mean we even <laughs> even around things like with being indirect like some people might you know be offended if their partner's closing their eyes you know, right, right, like, right. why don't you want to look at me, you know, when we're making love and, 
I know, or my husband's also inner vision. So it's like indirect inner, mm. I can see these layers, you know, and I think just like understanding his design and him understanding mine, like we can like dive into the depths a little bit more and like honor our each other and honor each other's body's desires, you know? Yeah. I feel like we can say like, I think variable is a really fascinating place to go to, like in terms of all of this, like this whole conversation, because like, I'll speak for myself, like I'm, I'm power view. So I like, I can see power dynamics in the bedroom. Right. And so they're fun to explore in a sense, like let's have a play. But if the power dynamic stays too long for me, mm -mm, it's not good. It's Mm -hmm. like, got to break that. It's like, I don't know. I don't know what part of my design like really speaks to that, but it's just like, I can't stay in one place like that for too long, Mm -hmm. especially if like the power dynamic is not equal. You know what I mean? Like, I think that I'm always kind of in a pursuit of like equality or equity. Like that's how I feel on the inside. Like I want to, I want one day to be like, my power view is useless. There are no more power dynamics. I mean, obviously that's impossible. That's never going to happen in this we lifetime. We need power dynamics. A little, a little, but like, I, I just know the, it's like, ugh, like the, mm. the fuckery of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The, the dark side of it. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Because I think there can be like healthy expression of power dynamics, especially like in the bedroom with consent, which I think, you know, I don't, know too much about the kink space but what i have watched and learned about it is consent is so huge Mm -hmm. in that community or that movement or whatever we want to call it and um i think that's something that's like really powerful to come out of that is exploring those power dynamics or those kinks or whatever with consent which also that podcast that you recommended i feel like was really good at yeah (laughs) like educated (laughs) and explaining that stuff for somebody who doesn't know things about that you know (laughs) like that was one plus side of it but um yeah i think that can be really empowering for people yeah it's all about awareness right if you do if you're doing these things without awareness it's going to be just coming from such a not always but like a much more sour place I feel it's much more distorted and something that I think about a lot in regards to this like also being touch cognition is like like you know how in couples like sex is the first thing to go when things start going bad or like things aren't being communicated like you know something just needs to be brought to light needs to be confronted and that's because the body can't lie the body can't lie. So if you are intimate with someone physically and they are touching you and you're touching them and there is no real response, and I don't mean just like a generator response, but like a physical response mm-hmm. from that person's body, if that's not there, it's like, of course, because the body's not going to lie to you. Mm-hmm. And if you ignore all of those cues enough times, the body's like, you're not listening to me. Mm-hmm. Ooh, I feel like that's some gate six wisdom coming through there. Of like, <laughs> you know, that that that's how I feel with gate six is it's the ultimate discernment of who and when I want to mm-hmm. be intimate, you know, and I've um, worked with some hanging 59s that didn't have the six where that was something they struggled with was discernment and mm-hmm. like who they allowed in. They would just kind of allow whoever in almost and just they'd have to learn this, the discernment around that. Whereas I feel like those of us with gate six kind of have this, it, it just feels like a hard line. You know, it's mm-hmm. like the door is closed. It is not the time to be intimate. And I see yours is unconscious. So is mine, Sarah. It's, it feels like a very physical, like visceral sensation where the door is just closed. Yeah. Mine is also, it's my unconscious moon. So it's my attraction sphere in the gene keys. So people are literally going to be attracted to that energy within me and how I like have brought some understanding to it. Cause obviously it's unconscious. I can only watch it happen, mm-hmm. but people definitely come towards me when 
they are looking for some kind of like peace that can only be resolved through a conflict. Mm. And I've had to really like come to terms with being a figure in that and being like playing that role and being like, yeah, that's like a role that I'm going to play because I've not always been comfortable with conflict. Let me tell you. Mm -hmm. Same. <laughs> yeah. That's but Yeah. People that's such a work in progress. <laughs> always. One of the things I love around like boundaries and consent um, when it comes to sex is there was this, what's her name? That sex chick on Instagram. I don't know if she still has it. There's another woman on Instagram that has it. There's a will want won't list. And it's like four pages of PDF and you go through and each person in the partnership goes through and like, are they a will? Are they a want? Are they a won't to things? And so you can kind of see where you're at and you can, you know, meet each other. So there's no like in the moment guessing um, because Teresa and I um, look through, look at a lot of things through the lens of German new medicine. And even if you think you're okay with it, sometimes your body isn't. And I really appreciated that list. I mean, as a sacral being, um, because I could, uh-huh, uh-huh, do the things kind of, and I'm right in the moment, right? So me and my husband did that. He took longer to go through his list, but um, there's just this, I could feel in my body if I was a yes or a no to those things, you know? And through the lens of German New Medicine, a lot of women will get UTIs, you know, bladder infections, kidney infections, and things like that from territorial conflicts. And they don't know why they have this continuous BV or this, these UTIs. And it's because a lot of times, like they think they're a yes, but their body's a no, yeah. but your body is not going to lie. I think that's so fascinating too, because it really tells us how the body can work in, you know, without the mind knowing the body can know something the mind doesn't know. Mm -hmm. And I've heard stories like in the German new medicine space where, somebody was getting like chronic UTIs and then later found out that their partner was cheating on them and they didn't know, but their body knew because mm -hmm. it's like, it's territorial, right? So the body could feel, Oh, there'd be, there's somebody else in my territory. Mm -hmm. And it's just wild that like the mind could not know, but the body's picking up on that. Yeah. I've doubled in German new medicine as well, which is like its whole own rabbit hole. <laughs> whole, yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. Even that for me, I'm like, I don't know if I want to investigate all that. Like, that's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. But definitely like the kind of fundamental, the foundation of it, I find to be true in that, you know, you have, you have a conflict and then there's something in the body that responds to that conflict. And you know, I know that in German new medicine, it's much more like biological programs. Like mm -hmm. that's the language for me. It's like a coming together of like all pieces of a puzzle, which is essentially saying the same thing, but it's like, it's the physical genetic and the emotional or spiritual you could say as well. Yeah. And it's like all of those things coming together to create like, boom, you know, like that, that physical reaction, because, you know, when we look at some people, they ha might have the exact same genetics and the exact same situation, but for some reason they don't, they don't respond. It's like, okay, well, what is that like extra thing that made one person react a particular way and that and another person did not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it plays into our differentiation too, because, yeah. you know, we're all going to respond to traumatic things or shocks differently depending on our worldview depending on how we were raised depending on what we've already experienced and so something could be like a trigger or a track for me that's not for somebody else so it's like and even the same the same thing could happen to both of us and we would have entirely different biological responses just because mm -hmm. our body or our, our psyche or subconscious interpreted that event differently in different ways so yeah it's fascinating it is definitely a rabbit hole so far from what I can tell this that system came through a one three pure individual 
with the 360 and the one eight, those channels were active all day, the day he was born. So I found that really fascinating. And you could tell because he was like, I want this stuff to be further tested. He was trying to give the information to universities and be like, try this out, test this out. Let's prove this is correct. You know, I'm like, I feel like only a one three would really do that because <laughs> you know, you're like, we need to make sure this is a solid foundation. We need to test it out. So anyways, side note, I found that interesting. That is so fascinating. I feel that, I mean, this is like, I feel, oh God, I've got like 5 million thoughts right now. <laughs> um, the There's a question I want, I'm going to bookmark. There's a question I want to ask you both. So I'll come back to that. Um, but if that's true, if he is, like if he was a 1-3, I find that fascinating, that piece, because, you know, that's like lower trigram profile. And so like, there is definitely, like, I know in my experience, there are things where I could be talking about something for so long and it doesn't get carried through to anyone until someone in the upper trigram, like carries it out. Mm. And so, you know, for him to have this, like this knowledge, this modality, and he's basically like, why won't anyone like listen to me? <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and it's so funny to think about it through that because if if anybody out there knows the origin story, he figured this out because of a personal experience that happened to him. His son died tragically and it was a total shock. And then he got testicular cancer and figured out that it was like exactly three months after his son passed away. And that's what prompted the whole evolution of it. And when you listen to the story, like he very much martyred himself. He got thrown in jail for having this information. Mm -hmm. Um, He was trying to bring this mutation to the medical field. In this book that I read about it, they were saying there was this uh, audio in German that came about and the it was some professor at one of the medical universities in Germany. And they were like, we know Dr. Homer's we know this information, his findings are accurate, but if this gets out, then this will completely change medicine. Like talk about a 360 mutation trying to happen, right? Mm -hmm. They were like, we basically, this can't get out. And they even made all their students sign something that said they will not use this information. It's just wild to me. And like, yeah, the fact that he got thrown in jail and got his license taken away, because so very third line, like willing to literally like go in jail for this cause. Oh my God. What a cool guy. I know, dude. <laughs> and he just like wanted everybody to have this information for free. He got a lot of flack because certain people were wanting to take the information and like make it very exclusive and not let everybody know. Like certain communities were like, other people can't know about this. Only we can know about this, you know? And he's like, no, everybody needs to know about this. It needs to be out there for free. You know, it's just, yeah, it's a wild um, investigation to look at that and see how different our medical field would be now if it was investigated more and taken seriously yeah this is when like I'm very much a skeptic like most of the time like you know one three I'm like eh, I don't know like to most things um but this is that's when I do get a bit like conspiracy vibes and I'm like and like fucking hell they just want to control us (laughs) you know like yeah same thing I'm like I think about how like in order for things to mutate and evolve, there do need to be like, this is going to sound fucked up, but sometimes like lives need to be lost, you know, for any like medical um, evolution, we've had to like lose lives, you know, because there's been experimentation. And I even think about how um, with like, like selfless or not selfless, uh, driverless vehicles are huge in my city because my city like signed on with this company to allow them to map our whole city. So we see them everywhere now and it's still like still kind of wild to see. But you think about how in order to create something like that, there's going to have to be accidents. There's going to have to be problems in order to get to that evolution. You're gonna have to fuck some shit up, you know? And so I think about the same with like the medical field in general, German medicine is saying, hey, let's not fuck with it as much as we are. And I get that in people's minds, that feels dangerous to not try to treat something immediately or, you know, throw all the kitchen sink at something immediately. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, like the whole point I'm trying to make is like, no matter what we're trying to change or evolve, like there's going to be a downside to that so that we can get to the next stage. 
you know? Mm -hmm. And so I get why people are afraid of it. And I get why doctors would be like skeptical and be like, this is going to be dangerous for people or whatever, because in their minds, they've been taught to like do all that they can in order to fix something instead of being more hands off about it, which is like such a metaphor for life in general. Right. Right. (laughs) Even human design says, wait, let's just wait, you know, don't act on everything all the time. Just wait. And I really feel like personally, if I wouldn't have been in my deconditioning process before I found GNM, the information probably wouldn't have landed as well as it has because it's like, it's just, it's kind of saying something similar to me. Well, and you have to take into consideration everybody's differentiation, right? Because yeah. we have people who are designed to fix and want and think, do the things and desire. And we need things. that. And, and we, we do need yeah, that. and we do need that. But I'll tell you, German new medicine is hope, motivation, dream, yeah. right? Mm. <laughs> Don't interfere with the natural process that's going on. What? Please sign yeah. me up, you know, or maybe knowing when not to, because in- there's been when times when interfere. you're like, oh, oh we yeah. need to go to the hospital, you know? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. I don't feel hopeful that this is going to resolve on its own. We got to go to the hospital. And yeah. so, yeah, yeah, I feel like there's there's an intelligence in that. And maybe that's why as a hope person, it's like easy for you to see that because you have that natural intelligence in you. And you're like, oh, okay, I get this. This just makes sense. Well, and I think I feel that German New Medicine helps us remember the natural intelligence in our own bodies. Yeah. That's why I love human design. That's, you know, it's these things that just remind you that you have what you need, that ev- like every that, that you are perfect. You're yeah. designed perfect. Your body's designed exactly how it's supposed to work. What do you need to do to support it? You know, what do you need to do to support your deconditioning? They kind of, you know, they're kind of the same. Yeah. Sarah, I'm curious what questions you wanted to ask us. You were like, bookmark that. <laughs> Yeah, I want to ask and like converse about what it's been like for the two of you, like what your sacral and sexual health has been like, and then like mine undefined. Mm -hmm. And especially like in terms of um, how quick like the healing process happens, like having that definition there or how slow having that definition there, like what yeah, I'm just really interested about, I want to tease that out. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the sacral <laughs> sound. <laughs> <laughs> just like, I didn't even realize I was making that noise. I was just bobbing my head. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I feel like there are times when, when I'm paying attention to my body, um, it's quick. Mm. When I am paying attention to the awarenesses that I get, it's quick. Teresa and I were just talking about this um, as far as like uh, reproductive health. Uh, I had a huge awareness earlier this month um, that could have to do with like reproductive, my, you know, just reproduction and some things that came up for me. And I just had one of the worst periods of my life. (laughs) And so I'm looking at it through the lens of German new medicine and looking at these awarenesses. And I feel like that wasn't a quote unquote, terrible period or something that I need to fix. What I saw that was, is like, there's something that shifted. And I feel like as a defined sacral, I have more access to noticing the differences quicker. I don't know if that makes sense. I notice things like, how do I want to say this? Like with the awarenesses that came up this month and how I was feeling during my period, it was terrible. I had like a terrible headache two days before, and then I had the worst cramps. It kind of felt like I was in labor. And normally somebody would kind of look at that. And I was like, you know, I did look at like what changed this month. Oh, I probably didn't get the greatest sleep, but there I could feel that there's like nothing quote unquote wrong, you know, like when 
when Andy would ask me a question about it, you know, is there something X, Y, Z? And I'd be like, huh, -uh," you know, no, Mm -hmm. it's it's doing what it need. I need to do. Um, but there's been times in the past where I'm not so in tune with my body and things are going on and they draw out and it takes a lot longer for any like healing to happen. Um, I feel like I have more access, you know, Vanessa talks about like where your openness is and where she can point, you know, point out like health issues and things like that. Um, I just feel like I have, and I'm spleen to sacral too. Mm. So I have this other awareness, you know, and it's very quick. And so I don't, I can really feel like that. I don't know the intuition of the spleen just, you know, go straight to my sacral. I know when, how do I, how am I trying to like verbalize this? It's just the feeling that I have. I can tell when something's off and needs support. And I can tell when something is just in repair. Yeah. Does that make sense? And it was so blocked for a long time. I want to say blocked. I don't know if that's the right word clogged up. Not my, not my reproductive organs. Maybe they were, I don't know, but (laughs) my awareness there was so clogged up for a long time because of my open solar plexus and like people pleasing and, you know, things that have happened through my life where I was so engaged in my not self through that center that I wasn't able to tap into the, or allow the awareness of my spleen to sacral and what was going on there. Yeah, that's interesting. So, yeah, I don't know if that, if any of, I don't even know if any of that made sense. (laughs) Do you feel like you notice that a certain cycles shift when you're, I guess I should backtrack. Ooh, yes. When you notice yourself really listening to your response. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you're saying. Uh Is your cycle better? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is, which would this past cycle two, three days ago when I was, was not good. I could easily, my mind could easily think that's not, you know, that's not good. And it could tell me you're not, not following the things, but I can feel the difference. I'm like, no, it's because this past month I've been like radically deconditioning my solar plexus which through a GNM lens, it would mean that you're healing something. Right. If you're and having so, symptoms. So. so I'm confident enough in my knowledge of GNM and confident enough in my, the wisdom in my body to recognize that and to not think that, you know, not go to worst case scenario, you know, not go to like, Oh, is this fucking endometriosis? I don't know. Oh my gosh, what's going on? No, I just had a terrible period, but I was like, so grateful. I'm like, that's so healing. And it's kind of weird that I can even think that, but that's not my norm. Yeah. It's like the way that it's shifted for me is if I notice symptoms or somebody else is telling me about their symptoms, like, Ooh, what'd you heal? What's been going on for you? You know? And that's, that's always the reflection question for me now. Cause I mean, you and I go through parallels a lot Mm -hmm. and I'm about to start my cycle and have had a lot more pain leading up to it than I usually do and like weird symptoms that I don't normally have and I moved through something really big a couple weeks ago that was very much related to like my you know like being a woman and having a Mm -hmm. being a woman that also has a cycle and is you know how do I Mm -hmm. put this you get it yeah yeah that that's (laughs) that's enough um yeah but yeah, and so it just felt all very related and interconnected. And then it even goes back to a diagnosis that I got a year ago. And I don't know if being emotional, things just take longer to unfold. I don't know if that's been your experience, Sarah, which is not so obvious at first. It's like if something's going on with your body, sometimes it can take a little while for things to make sense or things to like be clear and everything's starting to make sense now and I, I'm kind of seeing what my body's been trying to communicate with me 
Mm. or what has been reflected through my body and through my symptoms. That's it right there. It's allowing the body to communicate and being okay with it. And a lot of mine was around things I was avoiding. Yeah. You know, and then I stopped avoiding them and then I have a terrible period and somebody might not see those things as related or in a, a, a good way. But yeah, I don't know yeah, if that but... got into your question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it I mean... did. And the emotional piece, especially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've, I've wondered, I've been like pondering this for a little while because I heard um, there was these women talking about it on a GNM podcast and they were saying it's really important for women to reflect on their relationship with their cycle mm -hmm. and how, like how you found out about your period. What was that traumatic when you first got it? Um, was it celebrated? Was it seen as something negative? Um, because I got mine really young. I was like 10, which I think the standard age is maybe like 12, 11. I don't know. And I just remember I was like the only one in my, the only girl in my class, like going through these like physical visible changes and none of my friends had gotten theirs yet. And so I felt really different. And my mom acted like it was like a problem that I got it so young. And um, like she was scared that there was something wrong with me. And so I, I entered into quote unquote womanhood with fear mm -hmm. and anxiety around it and seeing it as something that may be different than my peers and seeing it as something that could potentially be pointing to something wrong with my body. And I have had to do a lot of reflection on that in not seeing getting my cycle as a negative thing. You know, because it's like from that young age, it was like this shock of, oh, my God, I'm going to have to go through this every month. Mm -hmm. And this this is what being a woman is like. This sucks, <laughs> you know, like from from a 10 year old perspective and seeing how that subconscious story just kind of like has carried through my adulthood. And so I don't know. I think it's really important for every woman to just kind of reflect on that because I've noticed that my pain and symptoms kind of directly correlate to my relationship to my cycle in the first place, mm. which also is like as sacral beings, it's our relationship to our own sacral. And again, coming back around to like honoring our response for me, honoring my response and my emotional clarity because they're the same channel. It goes hand in hand. So Yes. Oh my God. Yeah. I feel like I'm just having so many, <laughs> like so much is just like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm like, let's turn the question on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My, mm. yeah, my experience. Uh, yeah. Like I said, I love the emotional piece because for me, oh, so much time. Sometimes I do feel that there's like a nuance in that sometimes with an undefined center, things can heal really fast because there's nothing really to hook on to, but I still have quite a few gates there. So <laughs> there's a bit to hook on to. <laughs> um, yeah, it feels so, this conversation feels in this moment to me, like so important and just like, these things that we're seeing like out in the collective about the pill and oh no that doesn't affect you at all and it's like <laughs> ask any woman who's been on the pill and they will tell you no that changed me that changed me period yeah pun intended <laughs> mm -hmm. and I have like a really big question mark for me personally in that sometimes I'm not sure when things are mine or when it's something that I've absorbed and have taken on, which doesn't mean that when, when I say that it's not that it is, there's a flavor of it that is mine, you know, like it hooks into something that is true for me because let me put, let me pull apart that, that thought. 
you know, like when we take on something that's not ours, as soon as we realize it's not ours, it can be gone like that. Like it can be gone so fast. Mm -hmm. But if there is something in it that's for us, it's going to stay. And so like I'm in the middle of, so that I feel a bit tentative talking about it. I'm in the middle of like a really kind of frustrating healing phase with my, with my womb, with my Mm -hmm. pussy, you know, like Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's like, this is like years long Mm -hmm. and it's from years of ignoring And so I am like sitting in a lot of discomfort in like my own decisions and like going against like my body's knowing and doing things that I didn't want to do and or even like things that I did want to do but didn't listen to like all the cues to like get me to that place like properly, you know. And, yeah, it's just like. I recognize like, especially in this conversation, like how, not only how important it is, but also like being undefined here, just like how much care and attention I really have to put in this area of my body and of my life because, because I'm open there. Like it's so susceptible to whatever the fuck, Mm -hmm. (laughs) especially being a projector, you know, like, like uh, something that really sticks for me, like now, in like this phase of life is like this thing that Ra said in one of the projector um, lectures. And he's like, you have to look at people like, would you eat that person? Mm. You know? And now like, it it feels like crazy and also so hard not to be like a super like psychotic Virgo, like about it as well. (laughs) But there's a part of that that is also true in like, what is your health? What is your relationship to life? Because like, if I'm intimate with someone who's frustrated, who's angry, who's disappointed, who's bitter, like I'm going to be taking that on. And that's just like a really infuriating fact, Mm. (laughs) you know, I, as much as I'd love to be like, Hmm, what if a duck's back? Like nothing affects me. I mean, I'm a third line. I'm very resilient and also like a little bit dense, honestly, like, you know, that's why I think it's gotten to this point because I ignored all the cues because I, my body is like really, I've got to find spleen. Like my body heals like really quickly. I almost never get sick. And so when something does come up, I'm like, oh, fuck. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) all right, I'm like, I'm listening. And then I don't listen. And then I'm like, okay, I'm listening again. You know, it's like that very, like, I think it's a very third line thing to be like, no, yes. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I can relate to the spleen thing too. Just like putting Mm -hmm. something off and Mm -hmm. just not Mm -hmm. dealing with it. And (laughs) what's hard about like, looking at health issues through this lens of GNM or what can feel hard about it. I mean, first of all, it's just like an upside down way than what we've been taught, but Mm -hmm. also it's looking at your symptoms as a positive thing that feels like very gaslighty sometimes, you know, because it's like when you're experiencing some fucking terrible shit and it's like, Oh, you're in a healing phase. And it's like, okay, well, how long is this going to last? And how much, mm-hmm. I, how long may I be uncomfortable for? And what do I need to do to move this thing along? And mm-hmm. you can't, you just have to let the body do its thing. I mean, there's ways to support it, of course. And there's awareness that helps, you know, it's like, again, this is where there's so many parallels with human design because you could say, oh, you're just going to end up following your strategy and authority or not like the no choice of it all. But then it's like the awareness shifts that. Mm -hmm. awareness mutates and so that's the way I see it with health issues too it's like your awareness of what your subconscious stories are can Mm -hmm. shift it but at the same time the body has its own pace and we can never really change that pace from like a mental place you know yeah the way I like to describe it because again I like to describe everything like I can talk about it to kindergartners is like you know a race car track like a little kid with a matchbox race car track that has a loop in it and the symptoms are presenting and your body is 
like just trying to complete the loop, <laughs> just trying to like get the race car over the loop. And then we might, you know, interject with something and it knocks the car off the track and you got to start again. And so it's just your willingness to be able to just like human design, surrender, trust yourself, trust what's a yes and what's a no. Um, when you're not operating from the mind um, and allowing that discomfort and being able to sit in this discomfort, knowing yeah. that that's the like fuel that kind of gets the thing over the track. There is, you know, a time and a place to support the body. Um, and that's very much talked about in German new medicine, but it's knowing when, when to do the thing. And I think us having defined spleens does support us in that way, you know, mm. because I mean, if you're an undefined spleen listening, this isn't like a dig, but it's like <laughs> undefined spleens get sick. And it's like that man flu when, you know, they have, they're sick and they're like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sick. And then <laughs> defined spleens were like, we could be dying and you never know. <laughs> but I know. But I have to wonder about that, like, and because I've thought about it for myself, like, is that like, because we as defined spleens are so like thick about it. Like we're like, yeah, no, yes. that's fine. yes. And that's it where, is. yeah, it is. And that's where you have to like <laughs> use discernment and like, I feel like over the years I've resensitized to my body communicating and like the, the splenic whispers, because mm. I think conditioning is actually such a huge factor personally with um writing off what my spleen is trying to say because the spleen is actually trying to tell you when there's something something up you yeah. know and we can easily bypass that and I think yeah. undefined spleens at least from what I've witnessed I've seen the whole spectrum like my husband undefined spleen like he does not think about his health until he's like literally so sick Yep. And then he's like, oh, God, like what's happening? Mm -hmm. You know, whereas my mom's undefined spleen and she's like a hypochondriac. She's like constantly thinking there's something wrong with her, constantly Same. like afraid. And I'm like, where's the balance? Right. But with defined spleens, I think we're so conditioned by at least like in American society where it's just like like I've worked in restaurants my whole life. And this is gross, but like most every restaurant I've worked at, like hasn't given a shit if you're sick. If you can't get your shift covered, they're like, you got, you still got to work. And yep. it's just like this really toxic thing of, you know, restaurants or jobs or whatever, not caring if there's something wrong with you. And so then you go through that so many times in your life where you just do not prioritize your health. You're prioritizing making money and working and not letting people down before you prioritize your health. And I feel like for myself, you know, having like two and a half years where I didn't have a quote unquote regular job and I was just working for myself allowed me to completely like look at my health from a different lens because I could actually rest when I wanted to. And I didn't have to push myself. If I was sick, I could take as much time as I needed to get better. And I didn't feel like I was having to like not listen to my body and bypass the signals, you know? Um, so yeah, I think that's like a whole deconditioning process in and of itself. And even though defined spleens are sturdy and we can kind of put ourselves through more, um, it's like once you're sick, you've probably been putting it off for a really long time and ignoring the whispers for a really long time. Well, yeah. And Teresa and I both have undefined spleen, fear, motivation, mothers. So yeah. oh yeah, you too. You have oh. a, a fear, motivation, mother. Are they undefined spleen too? Oh yeah. Okay. So, so you can we relate. Have, we <laughs> yeah. have this like conditioning to like the what's the fucking whisper? You know, we didn't have anybody to like nurture the whisper. Well, and with my mom, she's she's a nurse and my grandpa was a surgeon. So my mom's like from a medical family. Like most of her like aunts and uncles were also in the medical field. So she's just grown up around this. Like she grew up, my grandpa would just like stitch my like my mom and her siblings up on the kitchen table like whatever um so she I feel like has this conditioning around who's the authority 
Mm. Like she doesn't, she almost like doesn't see herself as an, an authority for what's wrong with her body. She always is seeking outside of herself. I've noticed that with my husband too. I've noticed that with other undefined spleens is like, they don't trust their body to tell them what's wrong with them. So they're seeking it. And so for the longest time for her, it was like Western medicine. And then some, a switch flipped and she realized, oh, that's not, you know, that has its place, but it's not as effective as these other things or looking at things from a holistic perspective. But now she's like obsessed with researching things and looking into things and learning and looking to these other authorities. Like anytime I tell her I'm not feeling well or I got something going on, she'll send me like 30 different videos from all these people. And I'm like, mom, I, I know what's going on for myself. Like I've, I've already mm -hmm. figured it out or my spleen's told me or whatever. I don't need to listen to these 10 different people tell me what could possibly be wrong. Maybe you know, and these, all these different solutions that I could follow. So that's just what I'm noticing. I don't know. That might not resonate with like all undefined spleens out there, but I can see why it would be harder for them to like trust their bodies. Cause I've also had that come up with a couple of clients where they realize like, oh, I've always been seeking an authority outside of me to tell me what's wrong with me instead of just trusting myself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that's why we're in the game of human design, right? Is like, we are the authority at the end of the day. Yeah. What's really funny, actually, I want to mention, shout out to my mom. Um, <laughs> when I was getting into human design, because I've like, I've been in so many rabbit holes, like I've been on the precipice of cults, I would say. <laughs> Same. Um, yeah. And so she was like, I don't know about this raw guy. <laughs> she so, like, was researching so him. <laughs> She was so, yeah, she was like, mm -mm. she had such a big side eye from like her fear motivation, which like I totally, I mean that I feel like the, the skepticism and like the side eye is like the healthy part of like fear motivation. It's like, totally. Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, just like be careful, you know, like it's always like that. Is but she a two four also? Yeah. Yeah. Cause yeah, the second line's all about mm. discernment. Whereas mm -hmm. like first line, it's discernment, but it's from your own investigations. Or second yeah. line is like discernment from like my own mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. Do you feel like you had to, um, do you feel like that conditioned you a little bit when she was side eyeing it? Or were you like, I'm going to do whatever the fuck I want to do? Hmm. That's a great question. I feel like uh, when I was listening to your episode from last week or your last episode, Brandy, you said I'm very easily influenced. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, do I relate to that? Like I can be so, so easily influenced, which is why like the investigation is so, the personal trial and error and investigation is so important. Um. And over the years of my de deconditioning process, like I feel like I'm in a spot right now where I can feel the influence happening and I can choose whether or not to engage with it. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't like, like it can still fully get in and like kind of like, like pinball, like around my body and around my mind, but I can see it a lot clearer and I mean, when my mom said that to me, I just, I, I appreciated it. Cause I was like, my mom's looking out for me. Like she's watched me go down some weird, uh, avenues, <laughs> let's say. And so it was a really like useful reminder to like have my own center, which is like also mm -hmm. what we're, what we want at the right. end of the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a question and then it just left. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder it has to do with like undefined head Ajna. Um, I don't know. I have a completely open head, but I have a defined Ajna and I find that I can be influenced by certain people, but for the most part, I'm like, I don't know. I don't like, I kind of have more of like the initial side eye with things. Mm. Okay. So I want to, slightly pivot to a new topic yeah in go. relation to this because I, like I can be like if someone has head Ajna definition I'm like 
fuck me. <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm like, no, you're right. What yeah. you, what <laughs> what you, you said, said that is right. And I now agree suddenly. <laughs> yes. yes. I changed my mind. <laughs> Same. Same. But what I feel, and this is the this is the topic that I want to throw out, is about the ego center because ego and Ajna to me are like on the same level mm. in terms of influence. Like I know there's the whole like hierarchy of conditioning in terms of the centers, but I find that especially conviction of a defined ego is compar- comparable to the conviction of the Ajna. I would 100 as an open ego I 100% agree with that I think we even (laughs) talked a little bit about this sort of thing on our last episode where we were talking about the pressure that an a defined ego can put on an open ego and I yeah there's like a confidence from a defined ego where you're like well how could they be wrong they're so confident about it they are like standing their freaking ground they are like stone that will not move and that can really do a wonder on an open ego Mm -hmm. yeah but it's not so much about like I can see the parallels here but it's like there's a nuance because with the Ajna it's almost more about like ideas or conceptualization theories story um it's where there's opinion yeah. It's like the the opinion that like comes on to you and like gets, at least for me, like implanted into my mind feels the same. And, you know, like I have a defined ego, right? But I have a defined ego projector friend. And sometimes when she says something to me, I literally need to like take a step back because I'm like, you you just inserted something into me that I've like, I'm like, I don't want that conviction because like, Mm. I don't like, yeah, I don't believe in that. (laughs) Oh my God. I'm just like having an awareness because I'm, I'm surrounded by defined Ega. So I'm conditioned all the time by them. (laughs) And now I'm just thinking back to like, there's been times where I feel like this happened the other, like a couple weeks ago. Like my husband is like really into golf and he just like, told me something about some golfer like his opinion on something and I don't really know that much about it right but I'm a bartender and sometimes I just like have to kind of bullshit strike up conversations with people and I'll kind of pretend I know more than I do (laughs) like I just used his opinion I was like talking to some random dude at my bar about golf and I'm like oh yeah like and I said it was such fucking conviction and the guy was like well why do you say that like that's do you have like you said that with your whole chest you know and I'm like fuck I don't know. <laughs> I don't know <laughs> enough about golf to really stand on this, to stand on business here. <laughs> but it's like he will implant something in me. And it's especially with things I don't know a lot about already. And then if I'm talking to somebody who does, I'm like, wait a minute, why do I feel that way? I have no idea why I feel that way. And now I'm questioning my whole childhood because I've defined ego parents. And I'm like, how many times did they do that to me? And like, I just was standing on business on something I actually knew nothing about. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> because when something i care about like i will try to i have gate 62 i will get the facts i will come swinging you know i will figure out what we really need to be thinking about this thing but yeah thomas also has hanging 17 so he's got opinions off his (laughs) undefined ajna (laughs) i do something similar with my undefined ajna where i like and define throat where i will just like say an opinion to see if if it's true for me and that gets me into a lot of trouble (laughs) because I will just this is so like it happens with my family all the time because it's like a safe space to sort of like try out ideas and I'll be like anyway so what do you think about them controlling the weather and then my (laughs) like my whole family is like Sarah you don't even believe that and I'm like yeah but what if what if I did (laughs) like Oh my God. Brandy is exactly like that. Like one day we were talking, she was just like, but I don't know that the earth isn't flat. <laughs> like, no, no, for real. Yeah. You don't know. <laughs> you right. don't know I don't, I'm like, I don't know if it is or if it isn't. I don't know. And Where's my, the the, my <laughs> husband looks at me like I have six heads when I say that, but I'm like, no, I really don't know. I haven't seen it for myself. I don't know. 
Or like sometimes you'll say something though with such certainty and then I like question it and you're like, yeah, actually, I don't know. <laughs> it's like yes. you'll backtrack real quick and be like, oh, never mind. I don't I don't really know. I don't actually know. <laughs> well, that certainty doesn't come from the Ajna. It's my ego just backing up my undefined Ajna. <laughs> Trying to be certain. The confidence. You're feeling the confidence mm-hmm. of my uncertainty. You have to try it on. Like you yeah. just have to. Yeah. Have to yeah. Know for sure. I, t- yeah. I totally know what you mean though. I think that's yeah. just something that I think that's like very human to do that, to yeah. like try things out. And I think as fourth lines, I wonder if there's like a different, there's kind of like, we're seeing if this has influence over people because sometimes mm-hmm. I'll like throw something out there and I'm like, like you said, I'll kind of be like, do I believe that? And then I'm like, is this influencing this person? And then I'll be like, wait, I don't know if that's actually true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. because I can see that how much influence I have, but it's almost like we want to try and see. Yeah. 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 I do the same thing with, I think with my defined ego, I'll like, as, especially if I'm like, okay, I really don't know about this thing. I'll be like, yeah, like I saw this thing, no receipts. I have no receipts and I'll like state that. And then however that lands, I'm like, well, it's out of my hands now. <laughs> like just responsible. watch what happens. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> do you, Brandy, do you feel, and maybe Teresa, you as well with your defined Arjuna, like, do you feel really responsible for you were actually talking about this a little on your last episode, like about holding back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How responsible how does, for holding back? Like holding what back? Sorry, responsible for that was like two different sentences that I put together. Responsible <laughs> for that influence. Uh huh. Uh huh. From yeah. those centers. Yes, And then I guess where you do hold back, because like, I am pretty like, this is an opinion that I do believe in is that like, you know, if we have definition, like we're meant to have that definition for a reason. And I think that the ego center has got to be the most fucking warped, like center out of all of them in terms of like how we relate to that energy. Even like when people say, oh, like the you know, oh, it's your ego speaking. It's like my ego knows what is best for me. Mm. And so it's, but, but I hold back so much. Yes. Yeah. So I can feel I a difference. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I'm picking up what you're putting down. I can feel a difference when I say something. I don't know if it's cause that's ego to throat. Um, and I'm, it's very, my, that's very tribal for me. So it's very much like when I'm in that position of support, the keynotes, I can look at that situation and I can just, I just feel a difference in my body where I'm not worrying about influence. Like there's no other, none of my undefined centers are influencing me in that moment. I can feel this like peace with what I'm saying and I don't question it. And then there are times where I start to, I might be like experimenting with something different or trying something different. And it's not necessarily, I mean, it could fall under support, but it's like just me fucking around and finding out. And I'm trying to state it from with confidence and I can hear those other centers kind of chime in, especially my solar plexus and my Ajna. I can, you know, you don't really know what happens if somebody does this and you know and like what happens if you say this and somebody doesn't like it you know though I can hear those voices when I'm not in that full like support mode because when I'm saying something that supports somebody I don't even know what's coming out of my mouth I say it with like such steadiness and peace um and confidence versus like for instance, I mean, it's stupid, but I talk about raw liver on my stories all the time, you know, <clears throat> I still get a little bit of like, I don't know if that's for everybody, <laughs> you know, <laughs> when I'm talking about it, I don't, yeah. you know, I don't say it like everybody needs this, or this is what you need to do this. It's not from this like 
tower view, <laughs> you know? Um, it's more just like, hey, here's what I'm doing. I'm talking about it. I'm sharing, I'm sharing versus supporting. I feel mm. more like, I don't know if that makes any sense. Cause I still am like, oh fuck, what if it's not for everybody? And what if somebody tries it? Because the amount of messages I get after I share about beef liver is insane. <laughs> I should have stock. I should have an affiliate link for beef liver, for raw <laughs> liver. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of times where I'm speaking with somebody, I have to be careful about it at work or use discernment at work. Um, when I'm talking to people about what they're, uh, you know, at inner space, we help people like with their self-care, with their mental health, physical health, emotional health. But I am not a, in any way, a doctor or anything like that. But I, when I get passionate about something, it can very much come off as word. So mm -hmm. I always back it up with something to, to bring it back to that person. You know, it might be like muscle testing. It might be, you know, something where they can take that power back themselves. So it's not me. They're not just listening to me as word. They're having that support, but I still want them to feel autonomous in that situation. I feel like mm. there's like kind of a breakdown happening right now on social media with influence. And I think those of us who are conscious of our influence have, I have gate, I have gate 31 too. So, yeah like, I feel like a lot of influencers out there or people that are just like talking a lot on social media are fourth lines because it's very natural for us to just get on there and externalize and tell people what we're doing and influence people but I feel like if you were to look at like in the zeitgeist just like big influence out there who might may or may not be fourth lines there might not be that conscious awareness of how influential they are and what that could do if people listen to them from an unaware place, yeah, you know, and so people are getting called out all the time and stuff is being disputed and put on blast. You know, I feel like TikTok has really created this culture where you can like stitch something and call people out and be like, this is incorrect. This is misinformation. Da, 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 da. And I really see this happening more often. And sometimes I wonder, I'm like, is that like a five, one or a one, three correcting the fourth line? Mm -hmm. <laughs> saying like, This is incorrect. Whatever. You're just externalizing what you know for yourself or what's worked for you. Um, anyways, that was just kind of something that was interesting for me to ponder is how, how much that happens in the zeitgeist and how fourth lines can really create and st like stir something up, you know, and, what they're saying may or may not be true for the collective or it's not necessarily universal. And you until know. everybody is following their strategy and authority, I'll hold back. <laughs> so. Well, I think we just put a lot of disclaimers. Like I know yeah. myself, I'm like, I don't know if this is going to work for you. I don't know if this is true for you. Like yeah. there's so many disclaimers that you need because people will just like latch onto it and be like, cool, I'm going to run with this. I mean, I, I just wonder like if that is doing a disservice, you know, yeah. and like obviously yeah. you guys are both fourth line, so it, it has a totally different flavor than it does for me. But I do just like, I'll be real, like I, I hate the disclaimers. I do do them at times. And when I do them, I'm like, who am I, whose life am I meddling in right now? Like who am, who, whose business am I in instead of being like, no, this is what's true for me. And so it needs to be said in this way. And again, like I'm a one, three, so it's going to be like quite a different flavor than from like a lot of the other profiles. Yeah. But something that also occurred to me when you were speaking, Brandy, is how, you know, I've got, I've got hanging, like, I don't have a connection to the throat from, from my emotional ego definition. So I just sort of like go into everything, like a blasting that energy from my body, but it's not like making it, I don't know, like, I'd like, mm, I have big question mark there, but it doesn't feel like it makes it to the throat unless I'm connected to you know, like right now I'm hooked up to both mm -hmm. of you guys. So I'm like, woo, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm put together. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What is, 
what do you feel like um ha- so you have spleen to throw mm-hmm. so do you notice that energy of like your spleen coming out through your words versus how it would be a different quality if it was like emotions to words or do you notice the difference maybe between yourself and maybe people who have like emotions to throat? I don't know if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, I do feel that, I mean, the first thing is that I've had to find ways to communicate my emotions because it's not getting all the way there. And that has for me really manifested in a lot of ways as like emotional meltdown because it's like I can't like communicate to you what I'm trying to say and like what I'm experiencing and maybe what I need. And so it totally like ratchets, right? And then and then everything's fine normally after that. Yeah. <laughs> um, which is confusing because it's like that's correct, but also like the experience internally can be so tumultuous that I've had like as an adult like you know, really brought a lot of awareness to navigate that much more delicately Mm. than just having to have a blow up every time I need to tell someone something. And I think. Sorry. No, I don't mean to interrupt. I was just going to say you're keynoting what you're missing. (laughs) Oh. (laughs) 22 and 36. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like I don't have I don't have no grace. <laughs> um and I feel that. I really mm-hmm. feel that. And so I guess like to answer your question more directly, I suppose I mean the 1648 like like that eludes me as much as anything else that because like that is a fucking like well mm. that is like to me it feels the same as being like quad right almost like I don't know what's in there not fully and so there's like a piece where it's like okay there's like a health for me like it's healthy for me to speak Mm. that's what I know and so that's what I do when it feels right um but then the other thing is that every now and then there's just this fucking elusive like alpha channel that I only have half access to. (laughs) And so everyone's like, Sarah, you yell the alpha, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, that's awesome. But I don't know what the fuck to do with that. (laughs) I just have to hope for the best. (laughs) I feel like something I've noticed with that channel is it has to be, I mean, you're a projector, so there's already that element of recognition but it's like that channel feels like a very passive alpha to me mm. where it almost has to be elected. And I've noticed this, like one of my really good friends has that channel and in workspaces, she's the one that kind of gets elected to like speak for the group. And it's almost against her will where she's like, I don't really want to be in this leadership position. And then everybody's like, well, listen to her though. What does she have to say? Everybody needs to talk to her, you know? And then she's like, okay, I guess I'm speaking for the group, but it's almost like she has to be like pushed to the front and told that people need to listen to her, but she doesn't, it's almost like she doesn't know what needs to be said until she's in that moment of I'm being elected to say something. And now I have to do it. So it's not this like, I'm an alpha and everybody should listen to me. I feel like that may be like a distorted or mm-hmm. unhealthy expression of it because it it like at its core, it really is democratic. It's like, well, what's best for the group? You know, how how can my voice be used for the, the benefit of the group? You know? Yeah. I had a lot of like, like pings listening to your episode with jazz and when she was talking about like being collective and then I was like fuck like I'm so collective and I was just like these poor like individuals who I'm like coming at like hard and fast but also being a projector so there's like the one-on-one element like there's so much nuance and contradiction in every single person's chart like on the planet Mm -hmm. um but it is it is that it is like I mean, I think a lot of the time I'm like, oh, 
I'll do it because you guys fucking can't do it, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one through which, seeing where everybody's yeah. fucking up. <laughs> yeah. And so, but yeah, there is that piece of being like, like a lot of people look have reflected back to me, like Sarah, like you are, you have a lot to say, like you have a real authority in this. And I'm like, okay. I'm like, I mean, I guess like if you want, but also there's like with that seven being unconscious, like there's, oh, I think it's a seven. Yeah. There's like a massive, that's like my core wound. And the keynote to that is like something fucking crazy. It's like the ability to stand down, like when overthrown by the people, it's like something like. Okay. The abdicator. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Um, and that's like one of my three fourth lines, right? So it's like, okay, yeah, I'll I'll lead until you don't want me to lead anymore. Yeah, but I don't have any control over that. The capacity of the self to accept the judgment of others. Yeah. I feel like I've gotten that vibe from you. And there's a there's a flavor there that's really refreshing. I don't know if it is that specific gate, but I mean, that is the keynote, but it's like, there's a humility to you that is, it's refreshing, but it's not like, it's not to be confused with any weakness of any sort, because it's more of just like, there's a willingness to accept something from the outside that might be beneficial for change or evolution. Yeah, that's, I feel like that's really very much the 31, which is so much like, like I really resonate with the Gene Keys teaching about this energy, which is so much like, you know, a leader is like on the ground with you. Like they're like in the mud, yep. you know, like no one is better than anyone else. And that's like fact, yep. at least for me. Mm-hmm. And so I thank you so much for that reflection. Like, I really appreciate that. And I think it's also very third line. Mm -hmm. Like there's, I've spoken about it before on Instagram about like, there's this, like, <laughs> the, I know this isn't like a formal teaching, but they everyone gets projected on, but there's like this kind of like third line projection that occurs where people kind of look towards the third line and make it, it's it's more like assumption, which is a projection in and of itself, but the it's like feels a little bit different. There's a lot of assumption that happens in that like, oh my God, like third lines, you're so crazy. Mm. But at least I, I was thinking about this this morning. I was like, the third line kind of doesn't have time to worry about your projection. Mm. It's like very much like hands in the dirt, like we have things to do. You're projecting on me. You know, like I also have the 42 in a prominent placement. So it's like, if you want me to play that role, I'll play that role for you. If yeah. you cast me there, I'll do it. But I'm still like hands in the dirt. Yeah, and third lines I feel like have... Um there's there's a conviction there in like what you've third lined or what you've developed awareness around through your trial and error it's like a conviction that other lines don't have i don't really see it as mm -hmm. and i think that's almost where that martyrdom kind of comes from or the what we see in third lines as the martyr is that willingness to like i mean i'm being i'm exaggerating but well in some in some cases not but to die for your convictions mm. and i mean just i'm you know my husband's a three six so i noticed this with him where if it's something that he has really fucked with mm -hmm. and like gathered data from he is so much more convicted in it than i am and he also has a defined ego so there's that but like it's actually cov come from his lived experience. Whereas for me, sometimes it's just like a knowing or I'm sensing something and I'm like, I don't know, maybe it's this and kind of sensing this. 
But he's mm-hmm. like, no, I know this because I've fucked with this, you know? Yeah. I feel that so deeply. And I've made like memes about this before. I'm like, society, if you listen to third lines, like I swear to fucking God, like butterfly in the sky, like, (laughs) you know, I mean, obviously that's like, I don't, you know, I don't fully like believe in that, but there is a piece where it's like, we know because we did it. Like, please believe us. <laughs> yeah. And as a one three, there's going to be a lot less. Um, there's going to be a hesitancy to stand on business. And when you are, it's like, oh, fuck, you know what you're talking about. Because there's going to be that insecurity until it's there. So I feel like from what I've seen, like one threes are so much less likely to try to influence others and to like really stand on convictions unless it's something you've thoroughly fucked with yeah yeah it's true and I've had to come to terms like even recently about having like quite quite an insecure personality which is such a like you know nobody wants to be like I'm insecure but like I'm just recently I've been like I'm insecure it's okay yeah and like what I've recognized is that like I have people now in my life where I'm secure to be insecure yeah mm-hmm. I was saying, it reminds me of that meme where it's like the guy on the bus and on one side it's like rain and you know it's like dark and on the other side it's like rainbows and light and it's like you could be like I'm insecure or you could be like I'm insecure and <laughs> yeah. use that as a, a positive thing for yourself in that oh if I'm feeling insecure about this there's a reason for that yeah yeah and also my my motivation is also like insecure like there's that security sense underneath it you know so it's like I think from memory um so it's like I'm innocent but I'm like I gotta be like secure about it (laughs) 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 which is like a a whole other thing it's like pulling a power pulling apart the chart in this way is like so yeah. great but then you just got to put it back together and you're like fuck How does this all work <laughs> yeah I mean, I mean your chart's really interesting because I mean we were talking about the alpha channel and the leadership like there's literally leadership in the keynotes and then your innocence motivation so it's like that's a cosmic joke because on one hand you're not supposed to be a leader but on the other hand you are <laughs> you're just yep. a leader with, a leader with no agenda yeah yeah but I see power dynamics. Mm -hmm. That's all I see. So it's like, that is just the funniest thing. And I know Teresa, you and I have like the The reverse. Yeah. Which always feels like a fucking, I'm like, why did you give this to me? (laughs) The the contradictions in the chart. We love talking about those. I love it too. Like the tension, but also it's like, it really just is tension for our minds because mm-hmm. our design is just doing its thing, you know? And I feel like um, I love to theorize and story it. Like, cause when I look at a chart, I'm like, what's the story that's here? What's the story that's present? And so for myself, I'm like, oh, this is a character. I like to refer to myself as like a character because it holds it a little further away from me. But I'm like, this is a character who can see through a personal view and see things through a potentially like very objective view that also sees the individual in all of this versus the power dynamics. Mm. You know, it's like, I mean, raw had the same as me where he was personal and desire. And so that's why he was such like a champion for the individual aside from also being a pure individual, but you know, was this whole system is to champion the individual And I can see why I'm drawn to it through that because I don't like when I'm being myself, I don't really give a shit about the power dynamics. I'm like, but what's going on with each individual person? Mm. And there's an objectivity to that too, you know? Um, And then I, with my desire motivation, it's like, I come across as like very on my soapbox and like rah, rah, rah about it. (laughs) But what I'm seeing is kind of, hold back in a way so yeah you're just like you're the opposite of that where you're you're seeing the power dynamics 
play out, but then you're communicating that with a very objective essence, you know? Ideally. Yeah. Yeah. Ideally. <laughs> Some of the time, maybe not all of the time. Okay. That's, that's bound to happen. I want to, I want to ask you both. I have this like awareness in real time of like plugging into like whoever is talking. <laughs> I'm like, I'm wondering if you can feel it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's almost that? like plugging into where your focus is being pulled too, because I think sometimes one of us will start talking, but your focus is dwindling on whatever you found interesting that the other person may have said. And then you bring that back around, which I think is just fun to watch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always think about that, that quote from Ra that's like, if a project has two people in front of them, they made an enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Ra. And like, and you know, like there's, there's truth in that, but also there's so much, like I've spent so much of my energetic practice, like, like I can never, you know, I can never like, like encompass someone like a sacral, but I can like zoom out as much as possible and just like plug into like exactly like wherever my attention is pulled. Yeah. Um, and I've put a lot of a lot of willpower like into that because I mean also very third line I love like proving things wrong. <laughs> You're like where are the hole in where's the hole in this theory? You know exactly. I, had an ex I had an experience in person that really solidified that for me. I was hanging out with my friend who's a projector, my other friend who's a reflector, and the projector sat across from me, and it the reflector may as well have not been there. Like it was just like pure focus on me. And she even like we named it, you know, halfway through the hangout and we like checked in with the reflector. Like, how are you feeling? We realized we're not talking to you at all. And like, not really like this is a her and I conversation, you know, <laughs> and she was so aware. She was just like, I'm just enjoying watching you guys interact and like taking it in, you know, but it was just fascinating because my friend who's a projector was like, I'm physically trying to like move my body and look at our reflector friend over here. And I cannot like my aura will not stop focusing on you. And I imagine like because I'm a sacral, there was more of a pull, you know, and that's we were all just, you know, we're all human design people. So we were all speaking it out loud and just witnessing it with awareness and not taking anything personal. And I, it was like, she felt like a magnet to me yeah mm -hmm. very visceral in person so I, like I'm still feeling it on the the zoom um but yeah it was like way more visceral in a aura situation yeah in person it's just like I'm locked on yeah <laughs> locked on <laughs> yeah. like you're going to have to unlatch me <laughs> which yeah. is how it felt too like I had to be the one to be like okay I think we're done here after like you know four hours of conversation or whatever it's like uh -huh. okay I, I I release you from this conversation <laughs> oh my god I feel like that is so important that awareness like for anyone in relationship with a projector is like please let us go. Like we can try to unplug like as much as possible, but there is a certain part that has to be like unplugged from the sacral as well. Otherwise, at know, least like, right. like for me, it can be, especially as someone who has had to break bonds, like it's like violent, like to have to unplug from someone. And there's like mm -hmm. residue that you have to keep like going back for. Wow. At least that's in my experience. Mm. That's so interesting. I notice it a lot with my mom. She's a projector. And if I don't tell her I need to leave, like sometimes I feel like she can feel my sacral losing energy and she'll be like, do you want to go home? You know, it's like she'll ask me <laughs> yes or no question. And I think <laughs> but I feel like if I were to be like, no, I'm good, you know, she would just stay, it would just be, go all day like mm -hmm. um yeah really interesting I feel like whether projectors realize it or not like I'm sure the human design aware ones have felt this and can name it now of like oh the sacral is powering down and <laughs> they're ready to be done um but yeah I wonder if you know 
people like my mom who aren't necessarily aware that's what they're feeling, but all they're feeling is I want to ask them a question right now and, you know, see if there's a response to take in a different direction. Yeah, I can normally feel like, I mean, also just like context clues, like I'm very, like my my upbringing meant that I have both the sensitivity of like being able to read people really well, plus also being a projector. But like the downside of that is like hypervigilance. Mm -hmm. But in any case, like generally I'm like, okay, we're almost done. <laughs> like, or rather like you're almost done. <laughs> yeah. You so know? I have a question bringing it back to the beginning of our conversation. Now mm. that your emotionals are warmed up. <laughs> How is that? Now that we had foreplay. And now that yeah. we had foreplay. How is that for you in sexual relationships? Like, do you, as, an, as a non sacral with the theme, the not self theme being not knowing when enough is enough, how's that for, feel for you? Oh, man. Like, so I, I think I said to you, Brandy, in the DMs, like, when I've mainly only had sex with people who I knew were sacrals, at least like when I've had this knowledge. So in my early twenties, I, I don't really know about that. Um, but every person that I've been with, it's like, what are you done? <laughs> what do you mean you're done? We're just starting. <laughs> I'm like, what the hell? And then especially like with the sacral, like, and, you know, like sleeping with men in particular, it's like, it's like, boom, spent sacral, sacral man out. Like, like they're like, they're like rolling over. Like I, I don't like not in the stereotype way, but of course there is that like, they're like rolling over, like, good night, honey. And I'm like, huh? are you I'm like, I, I didn't just spend like fucking this much time, like absorbing you for you. <laughs> For you to like go to I'm sleep focusing right on now. you. Focus on me now. <laughs> but like I've also had those experiences where I'm like, yeah, 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 let's keep going. And like I can see how exhausting it is for the sacral to like keep going. And then like that doesn't feel good, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh well, you're not really like here. Oh my God. I have a I had a friend like years ago who was a projector. And she would always tell me about her sex capades because she was she's a six line and that was like pre Saturn return for her. Mm -hmm. And this was her exact like lived experience. I feel like <laughs> she was probably mostly dating generator dudes. And then she ended up having like a long term relationship with another projector because by then this time I knew about human design. And it was like her most healthy like sexual relationship. And it was like so different from any guy she'd ever been with. And she would talk about just having this like hours of focusing on each other and not even doing anything sexual and like having it just be you know focusing on each other sometimes and being yeah. intimate but not in a sexual way necessarily and how healing that was for her but she would I feel like she, what she was describing before was almost like amplifying sacral because she'd want to just like you said like keep going and like not knowing when enough is enough and not be able she'd like take it personally that her partner wouldn't want to keep going Mm. so totally. Sarah for you how does it do you ever feel like Teresa kind of mentioned it a little bit a couple minutes ago like focus on me mm. because like generators it's like about us projectors mm. it's about the other are you ever feel does it ever feel like fully reciprocal as far as mm. the focus Mm. or can you tell having sex with a generator that they're focusing because it satisfies them mm. it's like oh. you know like it's for them <laughs> oh that is so interesting I think that I definitely I feel like I can feel the difference I think also in terms of like, you know, when you're with, like when you're with a man who's just loves, like, like he gets turned on by like ple pleasuring a woman. Yeah. 
I feel like that that like realm in terms of like being with a generator that's probably like the closest you can get to in terms of like that focus um I mean I'll be honest I've also had a lot of bad sex so that yeah. is like yeah <laughs> so it's like it definitely has been like you know just at the start like talking about my design it's definitely been generator sex mm -hmm. And coming at it direct, like going straight in, like we're da 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 da. It's like ha a lot of the sex that I've had, not all, but some, has been like ha a lot of that like functional flavor. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if I'm like absorbing and amplifying, I'm like, well, no, no, like we got to do that mm -hmm. <laughs> because, mm -hmm. like, like, like absorbing, absorbing sacrals that need to get a fucking orgasm is like a nightmare. Mm. <laughs> like any, any like sacrals who are listening, listening, please just go like rub one out. Like it, <laughs> you'll do us all a favor. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. please. Like sex is so much more than that, <clears throat> than mm -hmm. just achieving orgasm. And like for anybody listening, just for the record, <laughs> I don't want people just thinking we're like, rabbits just like oh we just need to get off really yeah, quick like yeah, no, no I always need to be thoroughly warmed up mm -hmm. <laughs> like there you know it it isn't just this like real quick situation like my husband and I are both emotional so <laughs> there's always a warm-up but I I also think a lot of I feel like just this ends up being a man woman conversation too because it's yeah. like i think a lot of men are very conditioned by porn because mm. that's what they watch growing up to learn about sex and porn can oftentimes just be about like just getting off mm -hmm. you know depending on the porn you watch obviously there there is like well-made porn out there that is for the female gaze and all of that um but yeah i wonder if like so many men are actually conditioned to think they want something else than they actually want. I forget. I think it was like that. I hate to give Goop a shout out, but <laughs> was that Goop wow. talking, that Goop show on Netflix, I think, where they were talking yeah. about like the different sensations. Like there's like mm -hmm. feeling, mm -hmm. there's sexual, there's like all of that. And I remember one of the men described himself as liking like sexual pleasure, which meant, you know, having sex um you know mm -hmm. kind of think more like the raunchy side of it and then they actually went to experiment and he found out he was more of a feeling and sensation pleasure person so he actually didn't even need to have sex to get off and experience yeah. pleasure and that was like for me because I think when I'm in the mood I'm more of like a feeling and sensation person versus just a yeah let's just get our rocks off and like get mm -hmm. her done obviously that's like sometimes what's needed if but I also have noticed as a sacral and Brandy and I've talked about this mm -hmm. um, the more satisfied we are in our lives the less we seek like getting out frustration through sex Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I feel like in my younger years when I was like really frustrated yep. I was I required a lot more of that than I do now because I'm generally like satisfied most of the time and I look at sex as like a intimate connection with my partner versus I need to get my rocks off and like I need to release this this frustration this pent-up frustration mm-hmm because that's like all a lot of all it was. And that's why it was like, when I reflect back, it was like not awesome sex because it yeah. was just for a duty of getting out frustration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I wasn't seeking satisfaction through it necessarily. It was just to get out frustration. Just, yeah, exactly. Mm. Whereas like a, a, such a different viewpoint of it now. It's like, the only time I really want to do it is when I have the emotional capacity for that type of intimacy mm -hmm. to like give it what it deserves versus just doing it to get out frustration. Mm -hmm. And also like something that was pinging for me about like in this conversation is yes, not just like our human design type of course, but you know, what 
our physical body is and something that I've learned and investigated a lot is just how even knowing about the anatomy of the vulva and of the Mm -hmm. womb of like our whole pelvis is like distorted yes you know even just um even just like words like pelvic floor it's like it's a whole bowl like Mm -hmm. it's it's the pelvic bowl you know and like immediately going from like ooh the floor to like the bowl like that immediately makes it like 3d Mm -hmm. from this like the way that we're and also like the way that we relate to our body like so many women don't even like want to they've never even looked at like what their pussy looks like you know what I mean and so it's Mm -hmm. like how are you how are you going to communicate what you how you are like in a sexual like intimate connection if you if you're not even comfortable with like your own anatomy Mm -hmm. right And one thing I always like to do, which is just like me being a pest, is like I always love to ask men or people with penises, I'm like, do you know what your butthole looks like? (laughs) Do you know? Mm -hmm. I'm such a pest. I'm just like, have you looked? Get a mirror. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which just for me, I'm always like, how can you have a part of your body that you don't know what it looks like? That's so weird to me. I know, especially when it's something that's, like, so integral to who we are, like, in terms mm-hmm. of our, like, vulva and, you know, and, and there's, I think there's been a lot of shame around that. You know, there's mm-hmm. these surgeries where people can, like, I mean, no judgment if that's what you want to do, but they, like, get parts of it removed so that it looks a certain way. And it's, like, that to me is unfortunate that people feel like they need to do that because of conditioning and it's, like... I don't know to me it's like a snowflake like everyone is gonna look different and Mm -hmm. have their own nuance to it and there isn't a quote-unquote normal looking one you know it's it's unique to the person but I think a lot of women maybe avoid that or you know people with vaginas that avoid that because of discomfort or shame around it yeah and and tying that into when we had the conversation about sacral or non-sacral um, like healing in that area you know if you don't even want to look at it how are you going to be able to tap in with that wisdom that's there to heal yeah I have a friend who like took a class about it and it was like I think I think it was like a self-pleasure class or something but they really went into all of the anatomy and she like sent me the diagram and you know like different pleasure points in there and how long it really takes a woman to get turned on and get lubricated. And um, she realized she had a lot of conditioning around like needing to get off and like get off fast or whatever and how, how long it actually takes if you're like doing it properly and like doing it in a healthy way. And she said it was like a very healing experience just to start like working with herself in that way and getting to know herself and getting to know like what she likes and what she doesn't like and not feeling like there needs to be pressure or expectation on any of it. Yeah. There's a, um, there's someone who I've like resonated with a lot of her work could have been the same person or someone different. Um, her name's Carly Ray and she's a one four manifester. Uh, and I've always found her work really fascinating, especially because she does have an undefined sacral, you know, and then, and this is like her whole work is like internal, like massage and like healing the womb, you know, mm-hmm. like where the cervix is like, yeah, she's really, really fascinating mm-hmm. person. But something that as you were both speaking, something about, yeah, the time, the time it takes. And especially like whether you're, I feel like it, it, it is either sacral or like emotional, like these are the pieces that we're really speaking about. Mm-hmm. And I think for me as undefined sacral and emotional, like it takes so much time, mm. so much time. And there's like a lot of, 
again, like tying in, I guess, like everything that we've talked about, like there's a lot of confidence and conviction that I have to have to be able to like bring that through in a space like that. And also mm -hmm. like Brandy, what you were saying about the um, will want, won't. Mm -hmm. Like this is, I, I think just talking about sex, like before, you, like everyone needs to talk about sex before you even like get there. Mm -hmm. But, but we are not really conditioned for that. You know, everyone's just sort of like flailing around in the dark, hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. And then like, you have to tell someone that they've been rubbing like your inner thigh for like <laughs> five minutes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hope that you wouldn't, like, no one would let it get that long, but, you know. And, like, knowing about, it, like, everyone else's anatomy, you know, like, if you, like, whoever you're intimate with, like, what is what is their anatomy, not just, like, of the opposite sex or the same sex, but, like, how do they like it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess that's, like, yeah, it's something something for me like as a projector it's like I want to know like how my how the person I'm with like likes to be pleasured and I want them to know so I guess like to answer your question from much earlier Brandy like I think that one of the like tenderest like sore spots for me as a projector in relationship is when that is not reciprocated in the, mm -hmm. in the sense of like I want you to want to know mm -hmm. I want to tell you yeah yeah like well it's like I'm happy to tell you but please like just have the curiosity and that's yeah, like, like really yeah yeah it's like I don't want to have to tell you to want that or like oh, I feel know? that being in relationship with a projector I feel where I've fallen short and mm -hmm. we've discussed that you know um well because his focus is like so intense on you and yeah it's almost like you get like, it feels nice to be focused on. Yeah. I almost and... need to be asked. I, I'm so surrendered to my sacral right now. It's like I need to be asked, like, do you want to know mm. about what I want to know or what mm. I like, you know? And I think, I think that doing that, go ahead. I think that is like the biggest trap for a sacral projector relationship in that. And I've fallen into that trap in that, like, it's like the projector is like waiting to be invited and the sacral is like waiting to be asked. And then yes. everyone's just like, it's like a, yes. everyone's waiting and it's like this stalemate of like nothing. Yeah. And that's where I really think we have to bring like some fucking like, not that I have it, but like some grace. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise like we're never going to get anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, we we've talked about it. Like being um, okay with the clunkiness of the conversation around it. Exactly. It's not going to be perfect right off the bat. And it's also going to be awkward. And like, you're like, oh, shit, I didn't realize like, you know, because for me, I mean, I have 3410 coming off my sacral. Like, I don't give a shit. It's even like the gate of asexuality. Like, I don't fucking think about it. You know, I'm too busy doing whatever I want to do. You know, so I literally have had conversations with Andy, like, you need to, like, ask me. You need to pull me away from following my own convictions to ask me about those things. Because even I have gate 27 hanging off, which is, like, care and nurture, but it's selfishness. It's like, I'm only caring about myself. I don't, I can't help it. And so that will, want, won't list really helped like open up that conversation. And then also even this is a tip for, I guess, anybody, um, but it's been helpful for me as a generator is like in the moments, in the intimate moments, it's being asked, do you like this? Do you want, can I do this? It's mm -hmm. like, get my sacral involved in the process. Yeah. Because my <laughs> sacral is just so much about like my own self that like, and I need to know if I'm a yes or a no in the moment. Because I might have been a yes yesterday, but I might not be a yes. Like, we can't just rinse, repeat, and do the same thing. We can't watch the same movie every night, you know? Yeah. Because I might have been a no to something last night, and I might be a yes to it tonight. This is so much, like, for me, what you're describing feels like, I guess, the spectrum of curiosity to complacency. 
Mm -hmm. And we do that. I mean, in part, like we sort of have to do that. Otherwise, like our brains would explode, I think, if we had to check in with every single thing. But I think it is really important when you are in that intimate space. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important like always, but it would be very hard to have a conversation if you were like, and can we, and also, and just checking in. (laughs) Well, I wonder too, if this is why some relationships end up failing or people go outside of their relationship to look for certain things or have needs met because they're not talking about it. And so they're just assuming the person doesn't want to, or the person doesn't care Mm -hmm. or whatever. Cause that's something like Thomas and I pretty frequently check in on like, Hey, have we been doing this often enough for Mm -hmm. each other? Mm -hmm. Uh, Is there something we need to shift? Is there a different way we need to go about this? Um, And a lot of times it's just like, you good? Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, you good? Uh Uh-huh. And then we just both know we're okay, you know? And it just gives the other the opportunity to voice something Mm -hmm. if you're not okay and nip it in the bud Mm -hmm. ahead of time. Because we have had those problems in our past where I was like seeking something like, you know, when we were a lot younger before we were married, but where I was like seeking something outside of the relationship because I wasn't getting a certain need met. And Mm -hmm. I was too afraid to tell him because I didn't want to hurt his feelings. And he was too honestly dense to ask because he was not picking up on like signals that there was something wrong. And so it was just like both of us not communicating correctly. Mm -hmm. And isn't that it's so solar plexus. Like that whole thing. Yep. What were you going to say, Brandy? Oh, I was just say it's, and it's the, one of the benefits of understanding our designs is that we can, and our, the designs of our partners is we can communicate and it's not personal. You know, we can check in with each other and have those conversations. Like, this is what I need. Like, I'm going to be in my own zone until yeah. you pull me out of it. And mm-hmm. nothing is going to change that. That's an absolute. That's who I am. That's who I am. And so are you going to be okay with that? And like being able to express the things like, hey, sometimes I just like just quickly bend me over the kitchen counter. Come on. <laughs> Quick. You know? I love how you like said that through your teeth. Like. <laughs> it, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. It does. Uh, you, know, you know, I appreciate my husband's projector mastery of my body, but he's mastered the system of my body. Mm-hmm. And I will say something like, "Oh yeah, I like sensation play." And then all of a sudden, guess what? We have in our house because it shows up every, in the mail. Every fucking sensation thing you could possibly fucking want. <laughs> I'm like, that's enough. So we're coming <laughs> you know? over, and you're like, "Show her the claw. Show her the claw." <laughs> Because it's all this this Wolverine thing. Oh, yeah. And then I have no shame because I'm like, look at this. Look at this thing. Look at this thing, everybody. (laughs) I'm just sitting on your kitchen table. Because of my husband will just fucking be like, and this is what my wife said is okay. So I will get it all. We will master the system of sensation Mm -hmm. play, you know? (laughs) Mm -hmm. I, first of all, I definitely want that experience. (laughs) I'm like, I'm like, where's a I need a projector man? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Seriously. Go find your coming to my world. Yeah. But I, I, I really think we should have dating apps <laughs> for for types. <laughs> I know somebody out there's probably said this already, but like how cool they, would that be? <laughs> it's a human design dating they, app. They have it in fucking neutrino design in the oh, app. Yeah, they, where you can like connect with somebody. I don't think it, they call it dating though, right? Is it just like can you say you want something romantic is that an option yeah you can say like friendship I think I think you can say friendship or oh okay so we're getting there there's something Hmm. do they yeah do you have a picture or is it just charts it's just the chart it's very love is blind (laughs) oh I was gonna say that's like neutrino designs version of love is blind (laughs) (laughs) which that would be a really cool show where you could only see the person's chart and hear their voice (laughs) That that would definitely not work because no, it wouldn't. <laughs> the mind would just get way too involved. Oh yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I've done that once. I was like, okay, I need to. I did it with astrology though. I was like, I need to date someone with a this and a this, and they've got a this Venus because that would go really well with my blah blah blah. And da da da. And then I dated that person, and like, 
like this is the worst <laughs> this did not go well <laughs> yeah i was like oh okay um or you could easily just look for somebody who bridges your line. split yeah and be like oh they bridge my split so it's perfect <laughs> yeah which i like i mean that's a really fascinating thing because and i've been thinking about it a lot because i'm like i was made split for a reason like yeah. if i was meant to have those gates i would have them mm-hmm. but i don't so you know i don't know what the conclusion to that is but it it is like okay i'm i'm not meant to have grace i'm not meant to like be worrying about the emotional crisis or you could look at it as that's where you're meant to develop wisdom mm-hmm. um there was a there was a split up was <laughs> her face she was like oh uh, oof <laughs> I mean, I certainly know about the emotional crisis. Let me tell you. <laughs> right. I feel like it was Brandy Jordan. She's a split definition. She was talking about like how she's just like this really beautiful perspective of split definition. She was like, I used to see it as I was missing something, but then I started seeing it as that was where in my life I have emphasis on relationships. So I am meant to experience that, but I have to get that through my relationships. And so in turn, I get to see it as like, oh, I pulled in this like beautiful relationship so I could experience that. Like I can't experience it without relationship. So it just puts emphasis on relationship. Yes. Yep. I feel that. And I've definitely resisted that in a lot of ways, like you know, I mean, I have a sort of predisposition to isolation and like hyper independence. And so it's been like one of my like biggest teachings and endeavors in this life. And I feel like probably will continue to be so in that, you know, like what is, what is healthy relationship? What is a healthy bargain like what the, what the fuck does that even mean you know and being in connection like I'm I am wired for connection and that has I haven't always liked that about myself mm-hmm. and been really annoyed about it <laughs> I'm I like <laughs> that <laughs> yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, because if, if you see it as, like, it's almost like you need others to have your design play out fully, you know? It's almost like... Yeah, like I'm, almost, indi- I'm an independent woman. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's totally fine part of the time, right? But it's like in order mm-hmm. to really access the full potential of what you have, you're going to... And, and I think, by the way, this goes for all of us. I think the chart is or the frequency or whatever is by design that we're all Mm -hmm. interdependent there's just certain designs where there's emphasis on that Mm -hmm. yes yeah i had a thought but maybe it's gone (laughs) clean i i've had i've had to like really work on like is it spleen or is it paranoia (laughs) Do you know about, have you, do you relate to this? Uh-huh. <laughs> yes. Like the, um, like, I'll be like, Ooh, it's a splenic ping. And I'm like, no bitch. Like you're crazy. Yeah. No, like, the splenic pings are so subtle. And they're so quick. I'm like, if it's loud, it's fucking anxiety. It's the fucking, <laughs> yeah. the, the splenic. It's like a little fairy that just like, by. there's like, been so many times. There was one time a couple months ago. I don't know. I, so my Tom, my, my Thomas, my, my husband and I, <laughs> my we, were Thomas, we work at the same restaurant and he's a manager. So he has to have keys and like open and close the restaurant. And for some reason he just left his keys at home. Like his car key must've been off of his manager keys. I don't know. We were walking out the door and my spleen literally went keys and I completely ignored it. And we drove all the way down to work and he didn't have his fucking keys, but it was the quietest, most subtle, like I questioned it. I was like, he's got his keys. We wouldn't be able to drive if not, you know? And then we get down there and he was like, oh shit. Like I don't, I can't open the restaurant with my keys. And like, luckily 
there was a cook there that had keys but I was like dude I got a fucking Sabrina kid around that and again it's like so unconscious almost that my brain couldn't even process what my spleen was trying to tell me because I was so unaware you know but in the future when I hear that now I'm like okay I have to stop and like ask him do you have your keys or whatever why am I getting a hit around this well there's two like so your touch cognition and we're feeling and so if it link if it's like for me with feeling cognition if something is like like I'm like it feels like I'm kind of like be able to pull into it and like feel into it I can tell that's my cognition yeah. where spleen is just so like fuck I knew Boom. that was gonna happen or yeah. I knew that was gonna feeling for me and so I don't know how you relate with touch because we're very similar where you can like touch into something and it's like slower do you feel that difference for me with touch it's oh man like touch is fully it's like like what when Ra says when we get to the six it's like sci-fi like it is like yeah it's crazy like I like for me spleen is like spleen is often like like it feels like someone's like putting my body like hey attention to that it's like I'm getting pushed in a room and then I'm like a sim like why did I walk in this room like they've canceled the action and then (laughs) then it's like and it's very mundane Mm -hmm. It's like very just much to do with, you know, eating, well-being, like, yeah, like the keys even is just like a simple thing, a simple mundane thing. But touch and feeling is, yeah, sci-fi. Yeah, touch for me is like, I, I'm actually like, I think there's probably a misconception that touch people want to be touched all the time, but it's, you got to be touched by the right people you know like it's got to be like the correct touch and I have had a a lot of experiences where I've been like like viscerally like don't touch me because it's like I don't know like what you've got I I don't want what you've got and that like when that happens I mean that feels like almost splenic in a way because it's almost like a violent like do not do not do not pass go do not collect two hundred dollars Yep. Mm-hmm. And then for the rest of the time, I, I guess I just have the awareness that I am picking up on things and there's this kind of like exchange that happens that I can't even really know what that mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel very like when my, I work with my clients, like I, you know, like touch them. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. And they'll, they'll be like, whoa, this whole thing. I'm like, okay, <laughs> I love that. But I can't like grasp that with my mind. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I just, I mean, I don't know. It's a really bizarre thing, especially having like quite a few sixes in my variable. It's like, I feel like I feel like I'm a six that pretends to be a one three sometimes because (laughs) like there's so much going on under the surface that is at that like other level. Well, have you heard Ra's um, thing about how I think it's color is the true profile? Yeah, because the profiles are just our costumes. Yeah, the profile is like if you think about it it's the lines that are on the surface the most. And he was like, I don't remember how he phrases this exactly, but it was something about how like we were all really being ourselves all the time and like following strategy and authority anchored into that. It would actually be our colors that shine through. Mm. Again, I don't want to butcher it. I don't remember how exactly he said, but that he basically said that's the true profile. So you would actually be what, like a six, um, You'd be a six, six, <laughs> like mm-hmm. if that were a thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's the deep, it's a deeper layer. It's not at the surface, but it's like comparing like our like blood to our clothes, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, mm-hmm. yeah. Or like our skin to mm-hmm. our organs or something. Mm-hmm. It's like, there's a deeper, there's something deeper that's there, but it doesn't shine through most people. 
and or it takes I feel a while like, to. Yeah, and there's probably people who are better at seeing that within us, right? Yeah. In in that like, you know, there are people who are going to I know that there are people who look at me and they see chaos. Cuz of like the third line, I've got a Gemini body. That's what people see. And then there's this other part where it's like people look at me and they're like, "Whoa." And I'm like, "What? <laughs> Is something happening?" Mm. Like the the things that people reflect to me, I so I hate I hate this, but it is so like that projector thing. I'm like, I don't know what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. So I just have to like trust that you're seeing something that's true. Wow. Is that weird? Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as being generators. Like, what, so what is you, that? You like? guys feel like <laughs> fucking aliens to us because, yeah, like I get it. Like <laughs> projectors are still here to know themselves. It's just indirect. It's like you get yeah. to know yourself through your relationships and through other people. So yeah, you don't really know until you've like discovered that. But for us, it's like if we're really listening to our sacral, we just get to let that unfold, and it's yep. pretty black and white once it starts doing that. You know. <laughs> I mean, it feels like this is, okay, this is kind of how I feel. It feels like projectors are sort of like, you know, like we're the newest type, blah, blah, blah. It is almost like we've uh, come down to earth and we're all, like any projector is like doing life for the first time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like that's that's kind of what it feels like in the sense of like, whoa, like that's interesting. and Like, like watching whoa. an alien figure yeah. out what it is to be and human. they're well and then they're really yeah. good at shit you know there's shit that you're really good at <laughs> and you're like i don't even know what i'm doing let alone you're telling me i'm really good at this like <laughs> do that mm-hmm. all the time with andy uh-huh. and i yeah. you guys don't even realize like how what your stares are like to us Gosh. i was just listening to this pop culture yeah. podcast earlier and they were saying <laughs> they were talking about like Taylor Swift and how people who have met her have said she stares into your soul and like, like yeah because yeah, she's a projector she's and a projector like, you can and they're tell. acting like it's a weird thing that she does that and I'm like uh, yeah you guys just yeah. have these eyes that are just- yeah your <laughs> eyes like you can t- I, you, I can point out projectors like easiest all way the to time. clock a projector he, yeah just have them when they look oh, at you <laughs> yeah blocked it is, it is. those it's, eyes <laughs> it's crazy well like even cat's baby she'll post uh-huh. pictures of her baby and those eyes just shoot through the screen. And I'm like, that's oh, how I usually cow. know someone's a projector. Is it whether it's a picture or a person, but I'm looking at their eyes first yeah. and I'm not somebody who like likes eye contact naturally. Um, and I will always be drawn to looking at their eyes and I'm almost like, Whoa, yeah, <laughs> like I can't look them in the eyes for too long because their eyes are so intense. Mm-hmm. What does it feel like? It feels like I don't know. I don't I'm not okay. I'm also somebody that doesn't like physical touch and it feels like physical touch sometimes. Like it feels like I'm being touched and I'm like and cuz I live with a projector that looks at me every day and I sometimes I'm like my brain is like I'm supposed to look at you in the eyes and cuz I love you but <laughs> this is really intense. <laughs> There, it's like you're getting the full power of the aura it's not just eyes yeah you know yeah and so I think that's why it's harder I notice it's harder for me sometimes to look projectors in the eye but like if I'm really enjoying the focus sometimes yeah. I can I can Absolutely. look them in the eyes and like uh it it's like on one hand it's like easier too if there's yes that exchange happening and I'm really into the focus um you know they can see things. You, they can see you. Yeah. You feel naked, but not you feel like in they're a... tracking like every expression, everything. And that's what like I know. It's just, my mom's just the projector I spend the most time with, but I'll notice I'm a lot more aware of my own mannerisms when I'm around her because I'm like, oh, she's gonna read into that. Oh, she's gonna ask me about that. Oh, mm-hmm. like I can't get anything past her, mm-hmm. and it's a lot of times something I don't even know. Like she'll be like, oh, really? Or tell me more about that or whatever. And I'm like, well, I don't know how I feel yet. Like, give me a minute. Like, I don't know. <laughs> or they ask you a question. Projectors, they'll ask you a question. And you're like, 
uh, uh, I would. It wasn't even actually talking. I didn't know that's what you pulled from that, but it's a root, like it's that one of those mm. questions that hits, you know, and you're like, fuck. Mm. So I'm just more aware. Yes. Like you said, more, much more aware, Teresa. Mm. I I think that there also is the, like the, like for us projectors, we just have to be so discerning with our relationships again because people will feel so connected to us Mm -hmm. in a way that I hate to say it but it's like it's not necessarily true yeah like for us Mm -hmm. you know it could also just be that temporary focus it's like mm -hmm. I'm focused on you in the moment and then as soon as I'm gone my focus is elsewhere exactly and it's I think I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble (laughs) and by trouble I mean relationships I should not have been in like because of that because you know just being like they're like hey I really like you and I'm like oh my god that's awesome I guess we're in a relationship now Mm -hmm. and that I mean of course like that is not really like a correct invitation um but yeah it's just because it it feels good and there's like a certain flavor of sadness that like comes with that It's just like a truth that we have to like hold and know that people are going to feel some type of way, Mm -hmm. like, like from our focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or I imagine people get, um, people really feel it when the focus is gone, Mm -hmm. when the focus is not on you. Like I even noticed that like my mom, like if I'm going through something rough, my mom is like obsessed with me like she'll be like texting me like are you okay how are you feeling today like it could be emotional or physical or whatever and like as soon as I'm doing better she's not giving me that same focus and sometimes I'll like really feel the absence of it like wait why hasn't she texted me today Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know and it's like on one hand I'm like oh good she's like living her own life like I want (laughs) I love that for her and on the other hand I'm like hmm (laughs) like where's that focus (laughs) I have been told like multiple times like by people like people will be like are we okay like people will come to me and they'll be like are we like is our friendship okay like is this okay and I'm like I literally didn't even think about you like sorry to this man like our relationship is fine I was not thinking about it but you felt me unplug Mm. and yeah, I've definitely had that reflected about how not painful, but certainly like, oh, you know, when the projector does unplug, you know, mm-hmm. there's like a, oh, an absence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, guess that's like what it feels like. Kind of similar to like after intercourse and then it's like, oh, they remove themselves from you and you're like, no. Oh. <laughs> no longer in there. <laughs> it's no longer in there. <laughs> no longer penetrating. <laughs> That's why we say projectors get consent before you penetrate with your aura because. Hee <laughs> hee. Mm-hmm. Oopsies. Well, because somebody but... might not also know that you're penetrating until after you've depenetrated. <laughs> <laughs> I like deep penetrated. <laughs> and that projector focus can be for people that aren't aware of what's going on, like aura mechanics. It could be like the, you know, they could crave that. They could want you for your focus because they're not used to that. Yeah. I want to ask you, Brandy, about like in your relationship, do you find that My my kind of agenda for asking this question is about, you know, when I've been in relationships with people, I can get so fixated on the invitation. Mm-hmm. But when you're in an intimate relationship with someone, it's like you can't just be worrying about that all of the time. So I guess I'd really love to hear about from your perspective, you know, uh, uh, yeah, what is it like to be, like, can you feel the difference between, or what is the difference between like just being in relationship with a projector and then when a projector comes in uninvited? Mm. 
Well, I would say I'm not a generator that like yearns after the unplug, you know, like when, Mm -hmm. when my husband's focus isn't on me just in daily life, like I don't think about it because I'm designed to not think about it (laughs) (laughs) at all. You're doing your own thing. I'm doing my own thing. So I don't, I don't crave that, but I can definitely tell an uninvited projector that's trying to just plug into my aura. It's like, ugh, it literally, I feel it. Mm. Like it, it literally feels like who invited you, <laughs> you yeah. know, it's not pleasant at all. And if that's one thing I wish all projectors knew Hmm. is that whether people are conscious of it or have any awareness of human design it's like it feels intrusive and yeah. then you know but it doesn't like I mean it even does sometimes with my own husband hmm. you know like he sits down on the couch and it's not like he doesn't need, he doesn't need an invitation to sit down on a couch, but I can feel his aura if I wasn't like expecting it or, you know, it's just always, it's palpable. It's there. Yeah. I think that I've been very, I think that I've always sort of known that, but not consciously. It's, it, at least like that impact. Yeah. And does. so what I've always done is i have just withdraw. Yeah. And so obviously that, you know, like that is only useful for so long. Mm -hmm. And so my current kind of curiosities and like experimentation is about like, I, I am actively like pushing boundaries in my relationships, not, not like going against someone's actual Mm -hmm. boundary, but I'm pushing against my idea of where the limit is of a relationship in terms of my own presence Mm -hmm. because like I'll I'll be real with you like I'm like I'm a provocative bitch like I like someone I I do get the impression that it could be hard to be around me Mm. and that's okay it's hard to be around like lots of people Mm -hmm. I mean in particular kinds of designs you're like whoa oh my god yeah. like 3955 like one of my closest friends has 3955 and I just like I'm like hey and then I'm like oh yeah like something just gets yeah exactly <laughs> just like yeah and and so I feel like I get a sense of what it must be like to interact with me mm-hmm. and so yeah like I, I'm currently like where can I go without an invitation that is true you know because if I'm in a relationship with someone or my friendship like I don't need an invitation to message my friend like hey what's up Mm -hmm. yeah but the pathologization of human design like has definitely taken me there Mm. oh this is juicy Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I love talking about this Mm -hmm. how okay I have two questions. One question would be like, in your experiment so far, have you knowingly, I mean, as a one three, you probably have, have you knowingly just gone against it just to see what would happen? And yeah. then the follow-up question would be like, what was that like? Um. Okay. So yes, I have absolutely gone in without invitation, uh, knowingly and unknowingly. And what I feel most strongly is that The thing about an uninvited projector is that it's going to go in. Mm. It's going to go in. But it sort of goes in sideways. Mm. And so at least like, wait, there's sort of like two columns here. Like the first one is that when I've received like projector penetration uninvited, because I can, you know, like we can receive it as well. I'm always like, it like latches onto something and it's sticky and it like 
sort of like reverberates around my body and it's like it did get in but it feels you know it, it's uninvited it feels like a violation it feels like almost I hate to say this but it's like it is almost like parasitic mm. and it will like latch onto something it probably like mutates you in a way and you're kind of like but like reluctantly oh there's like a lot of resistance affects the other even without the invitation that's how I feel about it. And then as a, and then on the other side, the other column, if I penetrate someone without invitation, I get a kickback. I get an energetic kickback yep. and I get whiplash and contraction. It's like, so it really you know, it packs you energetically too. It does. And I think that I mean, that's honestly like why it's like, you know, the invitation, yes, it is for the other person, but like projector, it's for you. It's protective. Yeah. It's like the same thing as informing or like responding, like anything. It's like sampling. It's for your energy. Yes. Yeah. And like the consequence, I mean, especially as an emotional projector, like the consequence can be like really immense. My mom, I love her so much. And she's finally starting to get this, which everybody has their own timing. So I don't judge. I'm not saying that from a judgmental place. It's just like it's taken her a long time. But she's also in her 70s and has like a lot of conditioning to overcome and to find human design that late in life mm -hmm. is like a whole experience in its own. So like I have so much grace for her and not getting this because I've known about, I mean, she's known about it as long as I have at this point, because I've been externalizing to her about it for my almost the seven years that I've known about it. And I love it though. It's like so satisfying for me. She's been texting me like almost every time she does something without the invitation and tells me what it feels like. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's like really important for projectors to start just that having that awareness and like for her as a four, six, to like externalize it to somebody and name it. Um, it's like starting to seep into her being now. And I can see how like experiencing it multiple times and talking about it. And also like, I don't shame her for it. I'm like, Oh, what was that experience? Like, you know, tell me about it. And it, it's like exactly what you just described. Like she'll always feel bitter afterwards. She feels more drained. She feels like she wants to just like sulk away from the conversation and like go like lick her wounds. And it, I don't know. I just find it really endearing to observe a projector like deconditioning in real time like that. And also I have like so much sympathy for what that experience must be like. Mm. Yeah, it can feel lonely. It can feel really lonely. Yeah, because you just have to like it's it's in the name of the game it's like you just have to wait yeah mm -hmm. and the waiting can be like death you know it can be and especially when you do start like cultivating awareness around your relationships relationships fade away it's like being there there's like so many different flavors of void but that is a particular one um i feel like there's two distinct void flavors for a projector and that is the waiting where you're like oh my god it's like having cabin fever or something yeah you're just like okay i don't know what is gonna happen but you just have to wait and then the other void is after you have unplugged and you empty again and that can feel like you don't exist at least in my experience it has been like that especially you know like after being with people that you really love you really care about they love you you are seen you are recognized you are invited and then you go away and you're alone again Oof. It's like, okay, there's nothing for a time. 
Like there's no, um, I would imagine, especially like unplugging from generators and there's no life force. Exactly. Um, my friend who's also named Sarah, who's a reflector, uh, told me she did this experiment where she completely deconditioned from sacral and mm. went, I mean, aside from the transits, went 30 days without being around any sacrals. And she said the first two weeks felt like what she would think about as like a drug detox mm. where like she was like fiending for it. And it took so much to not go looking for it or seeking it out. And so, yeah, what you were just describing reminded me of that. And then she was like, after the first two weeks, I started just like really actually feeling my own body and realizing like I needed to like empty out the sacral energy that I've been taking in so much and it actually allowed her to like find her own flow and not be like hooked into a, a sacral all the time yeah so it's like the, on one hand there is that like scariness like you're talking about and then on the other hand I imagine like after a certain amount of time it kind of becomes like refreshing in a way yeah like you definitely there's like so the flavor of addiction in in there yeah and I think that Probably the reverse is, you know, when a sacral is like deconditioning from projector focus, like that could probably feel like quite similar. Um, but yeah, you just have to like, like claw at your arms and be like, I just need a hit. Just give me a little hit of sacral. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really fortunate in my experiment to have lived by myself for the last two and a half years. And so I've really gotten to know and be intimate with my energy and the peaks and valleys of that, much to my <laughs> discomfort. <laughs> you know, I'm like, oh, this is just me. I thought yeah, I can't blame anything for this. <laughs> yeah, can't blame anybody about this one. That's really, ooh, that is sobering, interesting. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, I've been through this really intense period of alone, aloneness and deconditioning. Like I haven't been completely alone, but I have been physically alone. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah, like moving into like this new season of my life, which I feel like is much more like relationship, um, like relationship is really like on the altar and like mm -hmm. what, what that is what that can truly be you know in truth like in differentiation like as we're living as ourselves wow feels like a rite of passage to be able to go through that to really get to know yourself and then be aware of like when it is time to integrate relationships again and be focusing on that yeah, it's been a blessing definitely, especially as, I mean, for anyone, but especially as a projector, you know, to be able to feel also different flavors of like connecting with different people and like different connection charts. And you're like, oh, like I really feel like, God, I do I know it when I'm hooked, when someone has a 59. Oh, my Lord. Maybe even like more so than the, 22 and the 36 like if someone has a 59 I'm like oh we fucking <laughs> <laughs> all of my exes have had the 59 <laughs> did you know like immediately upon meeting them was that like a sensation where it's like you meet the person and you're like we're fucking <laughs> uh with from the the third person that's when I was like oh okay that's what that that's is what that is <laughs> <laughs> had to experiment with that yeah <laughs> oh that's funny channel of mating yeah yeah <laughs> but not necessarily like the best right. thing for me right like <laughs> but very powerful yeah mm -hmm. it's like a it's almost like a animalistic drive sometimes with that channel like that's what i mean as somebody who has that channel when I've been like hooked into somebody, there is a kind of animalistic 
nature to it that just kind of takes over we're like i have no fucking control over this like this is just happening <laughs> Teresa and her husband have it so mm-hmm. she's partnered up with another 659 i mean that's here. good <laughs> yeah it's good hot for here. you <laughs> But to only have the six is like someone's like coming at me for intimacy and I'm like, no, we need to fight first. Mm. I'm like, we got to fight. I mean, maybe that's like a shadow expression, but like there's also a lot of conflict I find like at least in my holding of that that other side of that channel, it feels like you got to have the conflict to like get through to the intimacy. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Ugh, like that's, that's another thing that I hate. That is what it is. And I feel like that's something that I've had to really welcome into my life over the last couple of years is just seeing it as like, there's nothing wrong with me that this happens. And actually, if I just go head first into it, then I will see if this person is correct for me. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. everybody who's been correct for me, I've been able to come out on the other side of conflict, like skipping and holding hands with them you know and it's just like okay cool we're even closer now and like I saw a different side of you I feel like I could be more honest with you like I can be straight up we're not like dancing around some weird shit anymore and there's like a weird it's like a wall gets torn down it's really freeing for me at least well yeah at the like at the top of that gene key is like it's peace yep you know it's like and that I mean I'm like I don't talk about it as often but I'm just like ah I love the gene key so much and because it's so much more like contemplative yeah um so my mind can't latch on in the same way that it can with human design and so if you think about the only way to access peace is through conflict it like totally changes your relationship to a conflict Mm -hmm. yeah totally I agree with you. I'm a Gene Keys apologist through and through. (laughs) I will always stand on business for Richard Rudd because so he gets so much hate in the human design space. Oh my God. So, I mean, on one hand, I get it because people feel like he like wronged raw and like, maybe he did. I don't know the the whole tea about that, but like, on the other hand, I'm like, can you just like look at the work Mm. and if it's not for you, it's not for you, but you don't have to like tear him down if you don't like it, you know. So I listened to um, Richard Rudd on Rick Rubin's podcast. Oh, I've been need to listen to that. It's so good. He talks about that time where like he and Ra essentially had like a relationship dissolve, I suppose. Mm. And he talks about how like, Ra gave him, you know, the UK rights to human design and how he actually gave them back. I don't know if if many people know about that or if they're just inclined to forget that detail, but. Probably. Yeah. He, I can't remember what his process was, but it was something like, you know, I need to take this information in a new direction. Yeah. And he's always credited Ra. Yeah. Every gene, like. (laughs) Ra's name is there in the introduction or like he's never acted like Ra wasn't a part of his process yeah I've I've tried to find Richard's chart and I can't which drives me insane but I'm pretty sure he's a generator and he is he's a four Mm -hmm. six oh he's a four six yeah interesting I'm pretty sure I've seen his chart I think he has 64 he either has 64 47 or he has a 64 in like a very prominent placement and that's why it's like so abstract because I think that's I have an abstract mind I love abstraction and I think a lot of people struggle with it if that's not their cup of tea Mm. and again then they like talk shit about him or about his work or whatever because it's just like not the way their mind works but when you have an abstract mind and you read his work, it's like poetry. And it's like, I'm not taking it as factual. I'm reading it as art, you know? And, but there is, I feel like a lot of, like what you were saying earlier, you were like, it's not as um, like logical. So you have to contemplate it and you have mm-hmm. to like sit with it versus just having something like proven to you logically. It's almost like it gives people a, discomfort because they do have to sit with it 
Yeah, because mm-hmm. in human design we get all these answers, you know, like it is extremely practical in a lot of ways. It literally gives you a strategy. Yeah. Here's, here's what you do. And yeah. you're like, great, I'm going to do it or not if you're me. Yeah. And then Gene Keys, Richard is like, you ain't getting nothing. Yeah. You're getting, <laughs> you ain't getting no answers. Like you fucking like pull your hologenetic profile and you're like, first of all, what the fuck is hologenetic? Yeah. And then second of all, like, what are all these circles? Like the first, like the first chart I ever pulled was my Gene Keys chart. And I was like, huh? And then I pulled my human design chart and I was like, huh? What the hell? Like they were both equally as confusing, but the Gene Keys is just so much more elusive because it's not going to give you any answers. Yeah, which makes sense if he has 6447 too, because it's just like inspiring confusion. (laughs) Uh, Very bad. (laughs) And then, yeah, and then everyone's really uncomfortable, right? Because it's like, no, tell me what to do. Tell me how to, please, like, please, like, son, God, daddy, like, tell me how to live my life. Well, and Ra was a manifester, and he would tell us what to do a lot of the time. Like, of course, he'd say the caveat, follow your strategy and authority, but then he'd tell us what to do. Yeah, but, and and also no one's like, "Mm, I'm going to really, like, take everything that Ra says with a grain of salt. No, they were like... Hell yeah. Even me. I'm like, if he said it, it's true. <laughs> it's you know? true. I know. <laughs> so guilty of that. <laughs> and then, and then like, fortunately for me, I like, can't help but like fucking fuck around and find out what actually is true. And then I feel like my relationship to the system is yeah. Robust in a way that it's like, yeah, like I know that that's true. And I know that that is like, mm, take it or leave it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But it is so much more meditative to, like, sit with a gene key, like, just one gene key, and you're like, okay, like, you have these three keynotes, and then they fucking, like, blast you open. Yeah. It's been my experience. Like, reading the gene keys book, I have felt, like, mutations in real time. When I pull, like, clients' gene keys charts... Sometimes I like just start crying because I'm like, I can't believe this is inside of this person. Mm. So that's nice. (laughs) I love it. I'm, I'm glad to know that you're a Gene Keys person because now we can geek out over that. (laughs) Yes. I love the Gene Keys. You guys, I think we may have beat our time with jazz. (laughs) what what time is it oh my god it's it's been like three hours wow of course sarah with the defined ego had to come in here and beat the longest time (laughs) not even intentional we're gonna go longer (laughs) i was like i wonder how long we'll talk for but honestly I've, i've just been like i don't know if you felt it but i've been like reading you i'm like are we done are we done yeah are we done i can feel that a couple times yeah I was like, okay, we can, okay, we're still we'll going. going. <laughs> okay, let's have another orgasm. Let's go. <laughs> no, I mean, like, I'm just getting juiced up an hour in, so like, this is like perfect for me. I'm like, this has been nice. <laughs> but yeah, I am uh, getting hungry, so I feel like this is a good time to wrap it up. Um, this has been so great having you. Uh, yeah, amazing. <laughs> I've loved every minute of it. It's been great. Um, it's a welcomed focus. Yeah. Are you doing anything that you want to promote? Like, is it, can people work with you? Like, what's what's the dealio? Yes, people can definitely work with me in multiple ways. Um, I have my readings open for Gene Keys or Human Design or Astrology as well. I've been an astrology girly long before I found Human Design. Like, probably a lot of us. Um, and I've got long form mentorships, which are very bespoke. They're very fluid. And then I have my projector course, which is called life penetrated. And it is for projectors. It's for projectors to be like the best fucking projector that you could ever be. And it's in the thing about life penetrated is so much like in the conversation that we've had over these last fucking three hours, (laughs) It's like, it's all about aliveness. It's all about aliveness, right? And so if we are 
if we are here to penetrate other people, we're like penetrating other people's life force, yes, but what is it for a projector to penetrate life itself and to be resourced through like the current that is like, I mean, that's getting a bit like esoteric, but to be fully resourced by just the essence of life that is like available to us in any single moment. I love that. Mm -hmm. That's good shit. Uh, or every sacral I know is like, oh, I love that projector course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I'm like, sign like, me up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I the reason I love it is because I can see how beneficial that would be for projectors mm -hmm. to shift their um perception of life to that. Yes. Yeah. And I want nothing but empowered projectors. Yes. Fucking full stop. Hundred percent. Yeah. So, so they can find you on Instagram, Sarah with an H A Branton. We will tag, we'll put everything in the show notes. So, and then her website, sarahbranton.com. Check it mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thank you so much. This has been amazing.